My name is Joseph Ntabinijere, and my contribution in today's conference is very simple. I'll be assisting in directing today's proceedings. So to start with, I would like us to quickly just look through some housekeeping items. The conference is set four aspects. The first part today, and it will run us up until 10 o'clock between we're going to have our first break. We're going to be up from 10.15 to 12.15 is going to be our second segment, which will involve the second part of the keynote address. And from 12.15 to 12.30 is going to be our second break. Then from 12.00 to half past one, it's going to see us begin our first segment sessions. The first breakaway venue is here. Then we have the breakaway um, session outside. That's the first one. And the second venue is also outside just as we exit the door. We also have our freshening up um, areas just quickly outside the door so everything is accessible. In the between half past one and half past two, we're going to be having our lunch, which is going to be in our Panini restaurant. Then from half to quarter past four, us into our last segment of today's conference and the second part of the Please note there's going to be a change in the venue. In the second part of the lunch, we're going to maintain this main venue to shift to our two and breakaway room three. The first part is going to see us in breakaway and then breakaway room two and the second change venues. So we've got our room three. Then from half past four to half past four and between half past four to five minutes to five o'clock having our raffle and a vote of thanks and closing from the, the conference chair key Badru. And from quarter we're going to be having our social and networking, which is also going to be happening outside in the foyer. Some announcements also to add on to this in terms of housekeeping is we have an updated conference schedule, and it's just got a slight change between quarter to four o'clock and um, quarter past in the breakaway session three, breakaway room three. We're going to have taking place there. We have some QR codes on the walls there. So you can use them to scan and access the, the, the updated conference schedule. Also, we're going to access the, our evaluations. Um, one more aspect that we need to add is we have already set up the, the entertainment for the social and networking, but I've been asked to please caution everybody that they'll be only accessible between um, these, these times, which is quarter to five and um, seven o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I'd like to call who is the, the D, who is the Dean for the Director for Teaching and Learning, um, Professor Rabbi Dunpath. Thank you very much, Jerry, uh, for your eloquent introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the Teaching and Learning Portfolio, I offer you a very warm welcome to this inaugural Innovations in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Conference. And it's a significant milestone in that it signposts our maturity in our SOTL praxis. So to the many familiar faces who have graced our previous higher education conferences hosted by UTLO from 2009 to 2007, welcome again. And a special welcome to the less familiar faces joining us for the first time. 
Interestingly, uh, I mentioned the previous higher education conference. The one of the sub themes of the last higher education conference in 2000 and in 2017 was, in fact, new developments in the scholarship of teaching and learning. And our keynote speaker at that conference was Professor Lee Shulman, whom many of you will recognize as being one of the pioneers in the scholarship of teaching and learning. In his keynote address, Shulman commended UKZN for engaging, and in his words, engaging in SOTL in ways that exceeded any college of any university he knew of in the United States. So that was a vote of confidence then in our work, and that was then, 2017, and we've traveled quite far since our earlier initiation into SOTL. It is significant, therefore, that this, the first innovations in SOTL conference, promotes an expanded view of the scholarship of teaching and learning with a focus on advancing teaching innovation, research excellence, and a host of other attributes as will emerge in the conference presentations. So, why the preoccupation with innovation? Well, research continues to highlight between the emerging social learning approaches of students and the industrial age instructional approaches of lecturers. The gap is further highlighted by studies suggesting that there is a yawning dichotomy between student and lecturer usage of digital media, where the former inhabit this world as residents while the latter only visit when required. And as I've said before, some say that academics are in danger of joining a liturgy of predecessors such as elevator operators and lamp lighters. So in this conference then, academics, researchers, and allied staff continue to add their voices to contemporary education debates and share their innovative approaches, which have worked or not worked. Um, and will share with us how these have worked to shape their curricular pedagogy and assessment. So while lecturers may no longer control the elevator of education in the way that they once did, they are still responsible for igniting the lamp of learning, even though it now may require the click of a mouse rather than the squeak of chalk. A key challenge in managing a growing conference um, is providing developmental spaces for emerging academics and professional staff, while at the same time opening up those spaces to provide exposure to accomplished national and international scholars. We are extremely happy today to have been able to maintain that balance while simul simultaneously elevating the quality of presentations through a rigorous peer review process. The presence of our two keynote guests, Trini Jens Jensen and Jin Kuwata, whom we'll formally introduce later, elevates the stature of this conference. So I'm reminded by the words of environmentalist Paul Hawken, who shares his thoughts on innovation. And he says, the great thing about the dilemma we are in is that we get to reimagine every single thing we do. There isn't one thing we make, one single system we have that doesn't require a complete remake. What a great time to be born. What a great time to be alive because this generation gets to essentially completely change the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this collection, 
collection, the collection of key no note addresses, plenary sessions, and paper presentations will highlight the various perspectives and noteworthy practices in our quest to change the world by changing education. More importantly, we hope that this gathering will inspire the creation of new partnerships and new networks to tackle the formidable but promising challenges ahead. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I am now privileged to introduce you to our DVC of Teaching and Learning, Professor Sandila Sonka, who will address you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me quickly acknowledge uh, you all by saying that uh, I'm sure those people who are familiar with who is here, the so-called who is who in, uh, in the hierarchy, will observe that protocol. So I would like to observe that protocol also. But generally, I would like to acknowledge all the keynote speakers, the presenters, and everybody else, and acknowledge also my colleague, Professor Danpath. I feel really privileged to be here to um, open this event. As you know, this is a, 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 a somewhat of a burden that is often given to people um, regardless of their knowledge of the subject field. And um, thankfully, I um, was able to follow over the years the rapid rise of SOTL at the universities, especially here at UKZN. And for that reason, my talk today as I open this event is more of a reflection on uh, Peter Fenton's five principles of good practice practice in sort and in a way it's a yardstick that I've set before me to say if I were to evaluate myself and my university and my colleagues um, as a way of charting the way forward especially in the space of innovation within SOTL, uh, where, where, what would we have done very well, and what would we have done poorly and need to improve? So, in that regard, uh, I want to look at the scholarship of teaching and learning in general today. Um, the, the five areas of focus which Peter uh, 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 Felton um, put forward is uh, include inquiry focused on student learning and that inquiry that it should be grounded in the context of those students. And that context may vary in many ways. Also, he, he is of the view that the methodology should be sufficiently robust for the findings 
um, to be reliable and vetable. Um, but one of the key uh, principles that you've put forward is that uh, our enterprise is bound to fall flat on its face if it takes place without students. Hence, he puts forward the notion of partnerships with students. And then, of course, he closes by this, the conference, the research paper, etc. So, the objective of learning, the objective, uh, sorry, of education uh, must be placed in its proper context. It is learning. All other activities uh, fall into the category of means towards that objective. But the objective of uh, education is learning. Interestingly, the proponents of this ideology, they do not say who is the learner. And I think they were very wise in doing that because uh, you could f uh, get into a lot of trouble uh, specifying particularly the student as the learner. Look at me, I'm 65 years old and I'm learning more than ever before more than I was learning when I was a student. I'm learning from my students, I'm learning from my colleagues, I'm learning from the school of life. Therefore, in this researching of student learning, we ask questions about a specific aspect of learning, the learning that takes place with the student. And that learning is surrounded by a lot of other learnings, the learning by the professor, the learning by the institution, as we go through this, this what we call the institutional transformation, and also the institutional impact on society through the student. Therefore, the student learning is paramount. After all, the student is one of our three products, the primary one of our three products. The graduate we produce is the primary product. The knowledge we create is actually secondary. The economy and the society needs knowledge workers. So everybody else is looking to us as institutions of higher learning to keep producing those graduates. Therefore, they must learn. Alas, they learn sometimes stuff they ought not to have learned. Hence, we talk about later in life unlearning some things before learning of the proper things can be facilitated. And those of you who are still fortunate enough to be in the classroom, they know what I'm talking about. Almost always you have to deal with a lot of stuff within your student as you profile your students that you must first remove because you know you're not going to get far with these students because of what uh, the, 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 the stuff that they have learned already which is preventing them from learning properly going forward. I can't stress enough the, uh, what uh, uh, Peter Felton is a, a stress here in terms of student learning. So we collect data, we analyze data, we publish results, we ask new questions, but at the end of the day, we apply our knowledge that we've created through SORTL and the innovations in SORTL in the learning of the student, in the classroom, in the fieldwork, in the laboratory. If it's not about students, really, I don't know what it, it is about. When you, when you look now at what he propounds as a scholarly and local context, a lot of us, you will realize that what we do is we 
first and foremost contextualize uh, all of this within our subject, and this is correct. The primary context is the subject. I teach chemistry, that's what I teach. And my subtle cannot be about social science. My subtle has to be about chemistry. In fact, even in chemistry, it has to be about organic chemistry. But then it has to be about the student. The student is my context. What is the context of the student? We talk in our university in particular about quintal one to three students. That's a powerful context. We talk in our university, in fact, generally in universities in South Africa, about underprivileged students. That's a powerful context. We talk about students who have learning barriers due to language. And we talk about learning uh, uh, language transformation. That's a powerful context. So the context is a very important uh, aspect of the student learning. So we've got to try and understand the underlying theories of those contexts like subject, discipline, profession, relevant student learning issues, appropriate technology solutions, relevant transformation, and praxis. Today, there's a, an emerging context that is upon us, technology and AI. Yes, chat GPT, it's upon us. So he also talks about methodological integrity. If the methodology is not intact, you can be sure that your findings will either be flawed, so flawed in fact that your peers will pick up those flaws. And they will prevent that work from eventually making it to the student learning because it will produce what we talked about earlier students learning stuff that they ought not to have learned. Even now, as we're talking about innovations in student learning, our methodologies have got to be absolutely intact because they're going to be peer reviewed and our peers will say no, this will harm students. Our, 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 our proposals have got to go to ethical approvals. The ethical committees will say no, you're going to injure students. He goes now to the core of the matter, the relationships, the partnerships between students and staffs and staff academics. He also talks here about other relationships. But what's, what is amazing to me is that other scholars also have come into this to say, actually, there's a whole plethora of relationships that must be safeguarded. But at the end of the day, without good working relationships, we stand a very good chance of harming students. Now, colleagues, ask me, why are our students, in South Africa in particular, always up in arms? And I'm not saying who is wrong. Certainly, I know as part of management, I'm, uh, we are not wrong. <clears throat> this, these students are crazy. And this management is crazy. What does it say? There aren't relationships there. There aren't relationships there. In fact, okay, let me put it this way. There are relationships there, but they are antagonistic. They are not conducive to student learning. Hence, student relationships are paramount. We have, we have this thing of the student experience. The student experience is based on relationships. When they come, um, and I'm, see, I'm happy to see Ruth here because Ruth is, is the, the, the leader of my team in uh, FYE. And this is all about building relationships with the university, building relationships between students, building relationships between stakeholders within the university. We cannot therefore afford to have broken relationships 
or antagonistic relationships because the student experience will be lousy and students won't come, let alone learn. There's, therefore, there is a very fundamental uh, role of, of relationships. How I wish that our innovations will improve student relationships, will make students come to us and we to uh, us to go to students, an approach approach type of relationship. It's good to fight, but as long as you approach each other. Finally, he talks about uh, the publications, the publicity. Everything we do must be exposed to public scrutiny so that society, even communities of practice, should be able to say, we are either proud of what we do because of X, Y, and Z, or we are not. It must come here. We must share it in these conferences so that our colleagues can ask us questions. And finally, it must go into the journals and the books and, and everything where it will go further public scrutiny. So now I want to ask, what are the goals then for each of us, whether it's the student, whether it's the staff in the university. Certainly, each one in, the, in, a, in a relationship has got goals. And those goals, if the relationship is to uh, thrive and succeed, the goals must be upfront and open and clear. But more importantly, they must be realized. If innovation in, 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 in scholarship of teaching and learning uh, helps to build relationships and obviate the goals of each one. As a staff member, I want to publish papers and I want to showcase my new innovations and I want to earn a high profile for myself and I also want to improve my teaching uh, in my classroom. Hopefully, I also want to improve the learning by students. But what are the goals of students? Often students want uh, to get that degree. Their eyes so fixated on that degree that the road in between makes no difference. They will travel it any way it is traveled. They must be able, or at least be a, a, a made to focus on what is their goals in the journey. Once again, I would like to highlight the role of my colleagues, the uh, deans of teaching and learning and Professor Dunbath in the uh, FYE towards obviating those goals. Now, colleagues, I would like to, to say, think of your journey in ISORTL as an individual and ask yourself, what are the points in the four quadrant SWOT analysis? What are your key points in the four quadrant? What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? What are the opportunities that are emerging now? And what are the threats? We are saying ChatGPT is knocking on the door. What is it to you? Is it an opportunity or a threat? We are saying a new teaching and learning strategy is being crafted now. What will it present to you as an individual, as an academic, in your eyes sort? An opportunity, your capacity. You are yearning to publish papers and speak at conferences. Some of you have done so eloquently and successfully. Where do you put yourself? In that four quadrant, SWOT analysis. A, 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 a chart. Finally, I want to just take this opportunity briefly to say you will think that you have grown and you have learned so much through your subtle journey and that perhaps uh, you are grateful for, for, grateful for some of the experiences including this one. But let me share some good news for you. Nobody has learned more in this short journey 
than I have. Traveling this uh, isolated journey, I have seen a lot of things that I hadn't seen uh, prior to my last uh, five years. Uh, I've seen a very fundamental shift towards student-centeredness. A very fundamental shift towards the ideology that the purpose of education is learning and fundamentally learning by the student. So I want to wish you an excellent SOTL conference. Thank you very much. For the keynote address, I'd like to call upon the chair of the session, Professor Ravi Danpath, to introduce the speaker. Jerry, uh, thank you. lovely, inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Now, I want to express my sheer delight in introducing a delightful man. And he's been mingling with you this morning, sharing quips and jokes. And that is what defines Professor Jin Kiwata, uh, who is a professor in communication, media, and learning technology design at Teachers College, Columbia University. He's a learning experience designer, software developer, and instructor focusing on applied research and development at the intersections of those spaces. So in Jin's own words, he says he enjoys spending much of his time thinking about how to prepare future leaders and educators and the ways that we observe and understand phenomena during problem-solving endeavors. He directs the Cogmos Design Lab that explores how interactive software and systems can approach learning problems in novel ways that complement the cognitive and social aspects of human thinking, feeling, behaviors, and interactions. Uh, he holds a doctorate in education, MED in Instructional Media and Technology, and an MA in Education Leadership from Teachers College, Columbia University. So in my view, one of Jin's more influential scholarly influences has been in learning experience design, or LXD. And in one of his publications, he contends that the way we conceptualize, define, and practice learning experience design has changed over the decades in response to social and cultural demands for educational or training needs, technology, and learning theories. Different assumptions about how people learn and how best to support it have transformed and can now well, is now conceptualized as a scientific approach and a systematic process involving the development of creative solutions around possibilities and constraints within the design space in achieving concrete goals. Jin, welcome to South Africa, sir, and thank you for gracing this conference with your esteemed presence. Welcome. Just that much? Thank you. <laughs> While we're getting set up, again, just thank you so much for this warm welcome. This is my first time in Africa, South Africa to start. One of your colleagues was musing how, oh, I, I hope you didn't come in with too many preconceptions, you know, lions, you know, and stuff. But I see lions. I see lions. 
And when I talk to you all and hear the ideas that you have leading the way with new innovation, the spirit of education, and just hearing it reiterated in all the speeches that are going on, the learner, the journey, the process, it makes me feel like a company, and I can't be more happy to be here today. So bear with us as we're kind of setting this up. There is some from this meandering that a couple minutes, um, but I'm very excited to be here, and thank you very much. So. And let's give it up to the technical support that we have here. I was very late in letting them know I have a Google slide. <laughs> Much for your support. And great. Let's just go to the top. And then perfect. I think we can just jump to the. The AI can't solve this quite yet. Let's <laughs> we'll just go back. Let's go back. Up, up. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Hmm? Oh, yeah, please. No, it's okay, it's okay. Okay. Perfect. All right, we're back. I hope you all are awake. Um, I'm going to try to make this interesting for you, but artificial intelligence in higher education. This title, I was thinking, hmm, in higher education, artificial intelligence. I don't think it's just higher education. I think it's everywhere. And so a little bit about it in the context of higher education, but also in the classroom for learning outside of the classroom, and all kinds of things. And so as we go through this, we're gonna be focusing a lot on problem solving, which is my bread and butter, the possibilities that exist there, and the meaningfulness of the process. And I hope that something that I say speaks to you. Um, take the ideas you have here and accept the ones that, oh, this one really kind of fits me. And of course, there's maybe ideas that you can reject. I'd love to talk to you about those things because I think right now we are in that exploratory stage. We are having a discussion about what this means, and it's very important that we have that. So, before I forget, I would like to thank the University of KwaZulu-Natal for this wonderful organization and helping me out, the Teaching and Learning Office, UTLO, and of course, the ISOTO Conference organizers, uh, Dr. Um, Sandil Songha, Ruby Dunpath, and where's Badru? Badru. Thank you very much. Special thanks to Badru and Reginald and Zandil Sinda, who also helped me with all the kind of travel arrangements and things where I had no idea what I was doing. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and the invitation. I'm really honored to be here today. So as I was thinking about what to speak about, I took a look at the flyer um, and took a look at some of the things that were coming out from the different breakout sessions for today. And this is shamelessly uh, stolen from ChatGPT. I was like, ChatGPT, please help me understand the main themes of the ISOTL themes. Tech-driven education, student-centric approaches, innovative pedagogy, social and cultural relevance, academic support and assessment, career development. So like before, right, this real emphasis and value on what does it mean, the work we do, and what we do for learners, and that experience to help them grow. How does AI fit into this picture? Does it apply to you? 
Does it apply to your interests? And in response to that, right, it's really not a question of yes, no. It's really a question of how and why. For example, how can we use AI to gain insights that maybe we couldn't see before into the student experience? Why do we need to revitalize traditional subjects? Are they fine the way they are, or are we really missing something? How do we do it in a meaningful way with AI? How can we navigate AI in a culturally relevant way? You've probably heard a lot about how the way that AI is figuring out these algorithms and rules, that it comes from biased information. Where are we in the voice of that? How do we influence the future going forward? And so through our practice, as well as these bigger questions, how we contribute to the building of these technologies, like we are going to have to be a part of that discussion. And so these are the kinds of things that we are thinking about. And today, a little bit about me. My area, first of all, my name is Jin Kuwara. I think you read that in the flyer. Uh, my areas are in design, problem solving, and artificial intelligence. For me, the thing that matters is how do I get my students to become great designers? And how do I teach people to become designers as opposed to learning about just design, right? Because to develop into somebody that who, who will contribute, I think it's more than just knowledge of what is the facts, right? What are the frameworks? But really believing this is the value I imbue in everything that I'm going to create and impart onto this world. It's that voice that's also important. My interest in problem solving really comes from the idea that, hey, everything we do in life is about solving problems. Some problems are a little more interesting than others. Some problems we'd rather have somebody else. But the time we spend on this, in this world, we ought to be solving problems that are meaningful to us, that matter to us. And when we do that, we really release the best in us the opportunity to learn and grow and to inquire, and before we go by, because we're in that flow state. Meaning is really important, and it's through that process of solving these problems that wonderful things happen in learning. How do we support people through that process of learning to solve problems, and does AI have a place in that? It's one of the things we'll talk about. So artificial intelligence, can it support us? Can it support teachers? Can it support learners? How? And so today, right, for a lot of this talk, we are going to talk about this intersection. I'm going to share with you stories and examples and musings about my interactions with AI and what students have been doing with AI. And hopefully what that makes you do is inquire a little bit about what kinds of problems right, are meaningful to my students and my colleagues and myself. And finally, at the end, maybe we'll get to a point where we can generate meaning ourselves of how AI can be a part of our work, good work. That's where I hope to land. We'll find out. So this is a work that me and a colleague did, uh, a chapter from the Learn Experience, User Experience Research book. And one of the things that will kind of come about throughout this process are these cartoon characters. You know, we have and you know, trying new things, the latest and greatest. But I was just talking to one of your colleagues, and we were talking about really old technology. Um, for example, you know, right now AI is at the forefront. Wow, this new thing. But you know, so was television, so was radio, so was the chalkboard, right? And so was writing. And when I wrote this book, colleague, one of the questions we were talking about is, as people are going through and reading scholarly works that we do. Um, can we challenge the notion and innovate on what it means to actually get people to think in scholarly ways? And so a lot of it's on a comic that we wrote. And so some of the vignettes that I will share come from this. Uh, buy our book, just kidding, it's free. So you can just download it from the website up there. And um, learning experience design really is the practice of designing learning as a human-centered experience. And I think that's really important for many things that we were talking about. The human comes first, right? And that's something to think about, too, when we think about AI. Because a lot of times in the discussions that I've had with people, it seems to be this notion of us versus the machine. 
an antagonistic kind of relationship as was previously sought. But do we have to look at it that way? Can we look at it as a collaborative experience with this artificial intelligence subject? Or when we think about the notion of the social relationship between us and AI, does it have to be one of one-to-one? -one? Partly, I believe that some of the things that we can really think about is how we can use AI as an interactive partner that then others, our other human colleagues, can gather around and discuss and share and see perspectives, and there's value in that. This human-centric approach, thinking about what those meaningful goals are in design is a lot of what drives the work that I do. And of course, students to understand this. What kinds of challenges do novices face when they're practicing learning experience design? Why do we distinguish novices versus experts? How can this teach us about learning? How might we improve our practices? These are some of the questions that I came into when I started my AI work. And the fact is, right, um, you know, this idea of novices and experts, I acknowledge it doesn't fit everyone in a cookie cutter way. It isn't a monolithic idea or a category that you fit into, but it is kind of a useful way to highlight the differences that may be in the way different kinds of designers or thinkers look at phenomenon, think of phenomenon the level of granularity and specificity in which they can analyze things. And this is the kind of knowledge I think that's going to be particularly useful when we think about how do we then engage in AI in ways that we might not be right now. So we're all a little expert. We're all a little bit of novice. And this is convenient kind of conceptualization that'll get us to look at some of the works that I will show later with AI and how these works, the way we iterate and interact with it, change and evolve. And so this is a fun little comic that comes from the chapter that shows the vignettes between a novice and an expert designer. And I don't know how well you can see the text, but I will, I can't even see it on my slides right here, but I will kind of narrate a little bit. In the frame one, we kind of, is this, oh, there we go, we have a laser. In frame one, we have a student who is thinking about, hmm, how do I go about design? Addy, right? Analyze, design, develop, uh, what is it? Integrate, evaluate. And you know, they start thinking about things and come up with a solution. I know, in order to teach little girls how to code, I'm gonna make it fun and engaging. And you know, it's gonna be about using the latest and greatest technology, VR, yay. Maybe I was there at one point. Maybe you were there at one point, getting really excited about the newest and greatest tech. But as we look over to the other side and we look at somebody a little bit more seasoned, um, is it really about interest? Is that the main problem we're trying to solve? Is that what's causing teen girls to lose interest in programming? Is it boring? Is it difficult? Is it relevant? And the journey to try to understand the phenomenon structure behind what is causing people to disengage with learning, to not understand a concept. And that part takes a lot of time, a lot of experience, a lot of understanding. Seeing relationships in the design work that we do is a difficult thing. And if you've ever done instructional design or from a field that you are not an expert in, you know how difficult it is to understand what is the point of this content we're trying to build? What is the point of these interactions I'm trying to build? One of the things we observe at novices um, is that they have a lot of difficulty defining problems. And the reasons that they have this difficulty is partly because you cannot see what you do not know, right? It's in plain view, how do you not see it? But unless you've had the experience and the thought process to articulate that, it's really hard to see, even if it's right in front of your nose. If you cannot see, it's hard to make inferences. And learning is a complex relationship between parts, connected factors. So novices exhibit a lot of difficulty in identifying and defining problems. They tend to summarize and repeat information, right? They interpret givens as fixed boundaries. So. This is where we are. And how do we get them past that? Could AI possibly be a way to help them? But to do that, you know, 
how do we even start to engage? For example, one of the things that we kind of find with novice learners is if they give them AI and just tell them, go ahead, they'll ask a simple question. Mm, what's the best? I want to use VR. I want to do this and that. And chat GPT is very good at coming up with answers that we enjoy, right? That's kind of the goal of chat GPT. It isn't necessarily to give you the correct answer from however you kind of evaluate correctness. It's about trying to be as human as possible. And it's good at it, really good. And for example, one of the things that I've been working with students is, especially when in our field, Many students really don't have an understanding of what learning can be, what learning is, the different ways of looking at it. Learning is learning, right? Oh, the goal is that they understand. But is understanding the same regardless of whether you think about understanding facts, which require people to recall, understanding explanations, which means making connections and making inferences? Is it different than like sensing and seeing the world where I see this microphone and I know it's a mic, but I can distinguish it from a different one? That's a different kind of learning. Is it different? You know, how can we take a look at phenomena and see things like the feelings? Is that something that's learned too? To contextualize and connect it to our past experiences or to have preferences and interests or to be able to do the skills and the performance necessary, or even attitudes and the mannerisms that reflect it. What we found is when we start to kind of take learners and get them to start to think about the different granularities and divisions of what a learning experience can be, that's where they start to think about what kinds of ways can I start to articulate what learning is and how I want to use AI to help me on this quest. Being able to say what, or being able to say how and why. Being able to recognize what they've seen, or to be able to notice the fine details that differentiate. Asking you know, what the performance is, which represents what they can do or can't under criteria, or even feeling about certain ways. For, for many students, they never even think about this idea of attitude as something that can be learned. But we know that with the wrong attitude, nothing we say is going to make that matter better, right? So all of this is within our wheel set. And I think with learning experience design, one of the valuable things that kind of comes from this push and redefining is this idea that, of course, the way we engage and make meaning matter, right? What does it mean to use AI to think about questions and comments that help people to make that connection between the lived experience they already had and this new area that they're going to go into. So, learning design problems. This is some of the work that we've been doing um, where with this more specific way of looking at learning and talking and articulating learning, we kind of started investigating how ChatGPT responds. And so I'm gonna to try to read some of this. It's Pretty small on my screen too, but I'm gonna give this a shot. So here's a conversation between me and ChatGPT. Let's define some concepts and build a typology of learning. ChatGPT says, sure. What concepts would you like to define in order to build a typology of learning? And I say, well, you know, there's these dimensions. We can think of outcomes, we can think of targets. And I define what these things are, just like I just did before. Saying, doing, seeing, feeling. Targets might be things like fact, and here are the definitions. Here's how I conceptualize learning. And of course, you don't have to use this. I mean, people have used things like Gagne's types of learning, Bloom's taxonomy. It's pretty arbitrary, but the idea of us as educators knowing what we know, right, using this language to start to shape ChatGPT's way of constraining right, its responses starts to produce something way more than a prompt that is general, like ChatGPT, what's the best way to teach this, right? And so I feed it a scenario. And the scenario is something like this, and this is human made. The teacher asks Wyatt, what's the atomic number of helium? I don't know if some of you are having flashback nightmares from chemistry, but bear with me here. Wyatt correctly answers two, it's the number of protons, and the teacher says that's correct. Helium has two protons, and 
that's what gives it its atomic number and makes helium an atom. Helium has two protons, two neutrons, which makes it atomic weight, apparently, for you, since protons and neutrons are roughly the same atomic weight. She continues, but scientists found a particular atom, a peculiar atom, that weighs three you and ruled out the possibility that this is lithium. What atom could it be, and can you explain? And why it responds incorrectly? Hydrogen? Because it can't be helium. Helium has an atomic weight of four U. So obviously that's a kind of long thing, right? But I asked ChatGPT, based on our typology and the case that we just gave a student exhibiting certain behaviors, certain things a student says, certain facial expressions embedded in the story of how it might reflect what they're feeling, certain kinds of wrong answers, but certain kinds of context to give a hint of what the structural problem really is about. And ChatGPT starts to diagnose what this student's maybe learning challenge might be. ChatGPT says, based on this scenario, it appears why it seems to be having difficulty with the outcome of saying and the tech target explanations. He's able to recall the facts that helium has an atomic number of two, um, but struggles to understand the underlying concept and connection. He's not able to make reasoned inferences or connect the information given by the teacher to the question she asked him. He also doesn't seem to understand there's a possibility of an atom that is not helium but has the atomic weight of 3U. It's likely that why it needs and then goes on to give some advice. Turns out, ChatGPT is not too bad at making certain kinds of insights. But if, as the designer of those prompts, you know how to start structuring and contextualizing the kind of cases you give. Turns out, in some of the work that we did following this, ChatGP is actually pretty good at coming up with brand new cases as well. So how might AI help us to conceptualize some of our own understandings. And this is where a lot of exciting work is happening these days. What are the kinds of prompts we can give? How do the responses help us through this problem solving process? And some of the examples that I'm gonna give, maybe you can try with your own domain, is ChatGPT is pretty good at helping to illustrate thought process. So Jin asks ChatGPT conversations about models versus representations. Based on this conversation, can you create a checklist for me to assess whether something's representation or a model? And ChatGPT says, sure. Here's a checklist to help you assess whether something's a representation or model. Is the thing a simplified version of something or whatnot? Does the thing provide a specific mechanism? Is the thing used to explain? Is the thing, etc." You can imagine for many of us who recognize certain things, like what, is, what kind of learning is going on in this case, in this student, we're automatically processing these kinds of things in our head, connecting it to prior experiences that we have. It's automatized. But for someone new to the field, they, we take for granted what we can already do, right? But for new people, that's a very difficult thing. And having these kinds of things to begin to start to structure and illustrate what an expert might think that has become automated is one stepping stone into peering into each other's brains, peering into the process by which we go about thinking about these things. And that's a really valuable thing. When we talk about cognitive apprenticeship, that's the very notion of the idea. Back in the day when we were making, I don't know, swords out of iron, we would, the apprentice would look right at the, the the expert and the expert would be like, no, you hold it this way. And they're like, this way? And he's like, no, no, you're doing it wrong. I don't understand what I'm doing it wrong. And it's that process and dialogue and collaboration that they slowly adjust their behaviors, their thinking, their articulation. But the thing is, in this day and age, when we talk about apprenticeship from the cognitive world, we cannot see what's in each other's heads. Nor sometimes do we have the time to always share. And so this is an exciting area to me where ChatGPT or any other kind of AI might step in to reveal some of these ideas of what's going on in other people's heads so that we can, at our own pace, in our own ways, 
make those connections. Another example of AI and ChatGPT, things that it can do is help us to restructure the way we're thinking about ideas and problems, reorganizing and re-representing things from different ways. For example, Jin says, hey, this is great. Is there an order in which I should assess the criteria on this list? And if so, could you create for me a flow diagram of what I should assess first, and depending on the result, what I should assess next? And guess what? Hey, ChatGPT can do this too. Here's an example of a flow diagram and how you can use this checklist. Is it a simplified version of something that captures the important steps? If yes, go to step two. If no, it's a representation. Does the thing provide a specific mechanism for understanding and predicting phenomenon? If yes, go to step three. If no, it's a model. Again, you could imagine in our everyday work, once you get used to things, this is not something we manually do in our heads. It's automatic. But to be able to visualize this in a way that is step by step, process by process, again, for new learners, an invaluable tool to decode how other people think, to decode where one kind of path ends for them and the continued kind of questions that other people think about might turn into answers. So again, ChatGPT and AI has this possibility of helping us to take things that we already understand or think we understand and represent them in different ways. And by looking at it from these different angles, it challenges us to reevaluate our mental models of how the world works challenges us to have to introduce new ideas and place them into some kind of puzzle piece fit jigsaw in our head, or even challenge us to reject certain ideas we have and replace them with brand new ones. Testing one's own knowledge. How often have you learned something in your professional development careers and then later questioned, wait a second, do I really know what I'm talking about? I'm feeling that right now. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, but Jin says, give me a sample example of something for me to see if I understand this. ChatGPT, you give me the example, I'll respond with whether I think it's this or that, and I'll tell you why. You tell me if I'm correct and give an explanation why, right? And so one of the things that I, ChatGPT says is like, sure, here's an example for you to understand. Example, a mathematical equation that predicts the motion of a planet in its orbit around the sun. Is it a model or is it a representation? And so I go ahead and answer. It's a model, but I'm not sure if it's an epistemic one. I think it's not epistemic because it doesn't explain the underlying mechanisms, blah, blah, blah. It only tells me this and makes predictions, blah, blah, blah. And finally, ChatGPT responds with, you're correct. It's this, and this it has characteristics like this. And regarding your question about this, right, it might also be correct, and here's why. That's a pretty nuanced kind of response based on an argumentation that I'm making to test whether I understand something or not, based on knowledge that I've accumulated and put together. And ChatGPT here is working with me in new ways to re-examine what I've understood or come to understand. So, as you can see, there's a lot of different ways in which AI can be a part of our process, not just learning things and getting answers to things. A quote that I'm commonly quoted on when I do these AI talks is, Using AI to accomplish tasks in and of itself isn't very interesting. That's like a glorified Google. But whether ChatGPT or AI can help us with the process of understanding, to help us to re-examine and look at things within ourselves, to challenge and test how we've come to structure the relationships and understandings of facts and things of this world, that's interesting. That's an opportunity. So as we look back to the comic of the novice and the expert, and we think about the differences again, another kind of difference that we kind of find with students is novices are very difficult, like have difficulty thinking about design problems as multiple learning pathways and interactions. You probably understand this already. There isn't just a singular path 
to getting students to understand this or that. It doesn't always follow A to B to C to D, right? It has this kind of difficult kind of way. And in order to do that, right, we've kind of come to understand that one of the things we notice is designs, right, tend to be very singular, right, pathways for students. And it stems from them not able to consider multiple learning experiences. They understand learning as coming from what they've experienced as having been taught. And so when we're trying to think about our learners, for me, I'm trying to get them to understand that learning is a series of different kinds of goals that we put in context of different kinds of learners. From things like attitudes, I suck at math, mistakes are okay. Learning that might be what's necessary to reach the relationship to the skill. But there are these other aspects involved too, like being familiar with special symbols and programming, or the facts of what a function is, or the explanations which connect these things. Through coming up with these things and having students come up with these ideas and how they think learning happens, this is ultimately where we want them to get to, but have a reasoning for it. Learners, as we know, and we're challenged nowadays to adapt to different kinds of experiences and prior knowledge, have multiple pathways. One learner's pathway to getting to a certain place might not be the same as another. And what is the argumentation rationale that we have to think that this is the technology we should use and here's how we use it to help them to get those things, to get through that space? And so, you know, to go back to ChatGPT, there's a lot of different ways that we can kind of help students to think about these things. For example, argumentation. This is an example, and I'm not going to go too deep into it, but an argument where students are arguing with ChatGPT, I think this. What do you think? Well, I reject that, and here's why. And it's through that process of interacting with ChatGPT, with its infinite patience, that students get their ideas out. And articulating ideas is a very different cognitive thing than just thinking about it in your head. It reveals the holes in your logic. It reveals the gaps in your connections. And it challenges you to have to think from another perspective since now there's somebody challenging the notion of what you think you understand. From resume writing, right? Same kind of thing. This is an example which, to give you the short, student is kind of trying to improve their resume. But they all kind of start in a simple place of, hey, write me a resume. And that's boring, right? That's just doing a task, and it's not that different than a calculator. But using that opportunity to ask a student, what do you think makes a good resume? What do you think is what matters when it comes to sequencing the kinds of achievements you've had? What is the point of the story you want to convey about who you are? Then having ChatGPT create things, suddenly students are asking questions. They're challenging the notion of the response that comes back. This isn't quite what I wanted. This is actually a great thing when students realize this. It tells me that they are generative. It tells me that they're being inquisitive. And it tells me that they're being engaged in the writing process and the thinking process and the strategy necessary to become better presenters, better writers. This is the kind of activity we're looking for that cognitive activity of minds-on meaningfulness that help us from getting from answers to challenging people to grow, challenging people to rethink. So, you know, this is another example, right? Lily is in a class learning about the solar system. One of the tasks is to arrange pictures of the planet from the nearest to the sun to the furthest. Little Lily struggles with the task, and she misarranged the pictures, putting Venus before Mercury and Saturn before Jupiter. The teacher points to Lily first and asks, these are pretty, Lily. Tell me, what is this one? And Lily responds, that's Venus, that's Mercury, Earth and Mars, and oh, Saturn and Jupiter. And if you know anything about the order of the planets, there is a mistake here where she's flipping something. But what's really interesting is this is a case that was generated through my research group by ChatGPT based on the kinds of prompts that we were giving it in terms of as we want teachers who are in training, we want them to live vicariously through a lot of different experiences that other teachers might have seen 
We want them to go into a classroom and be prepared to see the different kinds of possibilities of why a student like Lily might be coming to the wrong answer. And it's not just about maybe she didn't know the facts. It might be that she can't make that inference. It might be that she physically, when she looks at the planet, thinks the red planet is Earth and you know, the green and blue one is Mars or whatever. There's a lot of different reasons why people might make mistakes. And mistakes come from a logical place in their head. Nobody makes a mistake knowing it's a mistake. There's a reasoning behind it. But what's fascinating about this is it took us several iterations to get to this point, but little nuances in this case, for example, that one's uh, Saturn and Jupiter. These are things that ChatGPT was able to produce with us through prompts such as, well, don't give the answer away, ChatGPT, but using that typology that we came up with, we really want to convey a notion of the kinds of mannerisms people give when they're unsure of something. Or, you know, thinking about this curriculum, the most difficult thing that students tend to have, which leads to these kinds of symptoms, is this type of explanatory reasoning, which is challenging. So can you cater this question in a way and shape it to emphasize that over things like engagement, motivation is the problem to everything, right? And we often get that with new teachers, right? They look at cases and they're often like, not engaged, not motivated, and that's not untrue, right? But there are certainly many other ways to look at why students do the things they do and to diagnose. So, you know, to kind of close, you know, you can see there's lots of different ways that AI can help us to think further, to think deeper, to see things that maybe we weren't able to see ourselves. I'm sure you've played with it and been surprised by the certain insights AI comes up with. So AI is so smart, is it going to replace me? I don't know how many of you are fearing that, but you shouldn't. The answer is probably no. <laughs> um, my opinion is that domain knowledge is still gonna be super relevant and important. For me, the domain knowledge of understanding what learning sciences is and teaching instructional designers, that knowledge of being able to see phenomena in granular ways is what I use as a way to shape the way AI interacts with my students and supports them through that process. When you're coming from different domains, there are ways that you talk about it, there are ways that you feel about it, there are ways that you value it, that AI, in a nutshell, does not come with default. And that's for us as educators to think about. What are the kinds of things that we want to imbue in these AI-created experiences that really shape the focus and tailor the active minds on that students will be engaging in. And once we kind of figure out that link that we are a partner in that process, not too many people I talk to are then afraid that AI is going to take over their job. In fact, I think it's the very opposite. I think it's gonna replace a lot of the meaningless work that we do. I mean, if there's anybody here who thinks every problem they solve in the day is amazing and useful, God bless you. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you right now, there are things that I like more than others, but that's where we should be aiming for this, to use it in a way that really helps us to focus and pay more attention to the important things that inspire us, excite us, challenge us. And just a kind of summary, this conversation has been going on forever. I mentioned blackboards as a technology and this is a conversation created by AI about the perspective of someone from 1801 talking about blackboards. How are you doing in the classroom? You know, everything's all right, but I'm a bit suspicious and uneasy about this new technology, the chalkboard. Ah, yes, the chalkboard. I must say, they do make writing easier to read. And I share your sentiment. Exactly. Do you ever wonder if chalkboards, you know, could replace us one day? And replace us? That's an intriguing thought. How do you mean? Well, these chalkboards allow students to focus on written words more easily. What if they don't need us to explain concepts anymore? What if written textbooks or self-study methods become sufficient? Ah, the dilemma. And so, I mean, this is a silly example, right? But don't worry. Hooray, our jobs are saved. Um, to kind of close it off, I think it's going to be something that as we mindfully go about, and there are pitfalls and things we need to be careful of, but if we are, and we bring to it our best, our domain understanding, our knowledge, our passion, our values, 
I think it will be something that can enhance our creativity and meaningfulness. Use your domain knowledge, your curiosity and motivation. Use it with AI or any other tech for that matter to generate new insights, to generate interesting new questions and to inquire. Inspire yourself, your colleagues, your students, because it's all in the process of learning, right? So I think I might just kind of skip over the poem, but you know, the example here is really just about showing how ChatGPT, from the programming learning perspective and the domain knowledge of understanding how programming works, could end up being interdisciplinary, working with language arts and things of that nature. And so to get to this point, you know, it kind of had to have a lot of understanding about what is it I want students to learn through the creation of a fun poem. A computer teacher might describe the concept as letting a keyword, like let is the keyword for a variable, or declaration means this, or this and that. And so the kind of comment that ChatGPT came up with is, hey, a keyword to declare, let variables take a dare, and X is the name we choose, a reference we can't refuse. This might seem silly in some sense, but what I find is when I give an assignment like this to students to come up with poetry, to teach science or to teach math or teach whatever, suddenly it opens up new doors for them to kind of think about, hey, interests I have and things I understand, but also, you know, they don't come up with poems that, for example, highlight the con concept of evolution in the way that we might through a curriculum. That's where the human support comes in. It's teachers guiding students. Well, what is the most important thing that a poem is trying to achieve if you're trying to make a poem that connects and teaches? And they have to go research, they have to go inquire, right? So, let me kind of, I'm starting to get some like glares from over there about the time and stuff like that, which I think I'm still a little under. But opportunities and inquiring, um, domain knowledge matters. Here's another student example where they were trying to produce a Chinese painting. So again, cross-disciplinary, we can use it in many different ways. And they weren't coming up with very good examples. Uh, it, wasn't, it was coming up with very Western types of paintings and such. And the student reflection was one where it's like, the first image was a result of this prompt, and the second one was after I changed my Chinese rural countryside. And I don't see much of a difference in how AI is producing these images. And you know, have you tied, tried talking in a stylistic cue? Have you tried incorporating the concepts of the element of art? Right? Try creating rules and parameters and constraints using the language of art. And so it's this understanding of the domain that's necessary to then produce things that represent what a student understands as artwork representing a time, a period, or whatever. So there's plenty of space, folks, for us to be a part of that equation, for us to be able to guide students to think in certain ways, to chase after the new interests and curiosities that they have. ChatGPT isn't the end of the kinds of things that they are going to go do. So problem solving is a collaborative growth process. Intentional, meaningful problems. Learning growth comes from challenge and value and joy. The problems themselves provide spaces for opportunities. And it's not necessarily just a map, right? It needs the right support. And I think that going forward, AI is going to be important, but so will the ways in which we collaborate with it, with each other, and to make sense of the work that we do. So with that, good job for getting through this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jin, for that illuminating provocation. And I say because I dare say the age amongst us will um, our cynicism and suspicion. I think the takeaway is that you've demonstrated possibilities, potentialities, and hazards of AI, including be used for us as teachers to take and how it accommodates learning styles, which we often ignore in the classroom, and alternative pathways and the value of interactions. And I think for me, the, 
the most profound benefit for, of AI is its ability to and act from different perspectives which we might not have considered and which delivers profound outcomes. So thank you for that, Jin. I hope you can hear me. I don't know if uh, my sound is getting through to you. Loud and clear. Thank you very Great. much. Great. And welcome, Trini. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, Trini is an executive with the International Association of Universities, the IAU. And as a matter of interest, the IAU is the only global association which was created in the 1950s to support universities achieve their strategic priorities, which includes leadership, internationalization, sustainable development, and digital transformation. And Trini joined the IAU in 2012, where she leads the strategic priority on higher education, digital transformation. And she's spearheading <coughs> several in interesting projects uh, spanning policy, strategy, advocacy, and especially in, in her portfolio, monitoring digital transformation of higher education with global partners. So as she's the author of the IAU Global Monitoring Report on higher education in the digital era. era. Um, and she leads on the IAU policy statement, transforming higher education for the global common good in the digital world. In 2019, she launched a new program entitled Institutional Site Visits, fostering international peer-to-peer -peer learning in relation to digital transformation in higher education. Um, and, and, and that strand from, is, is how I actually got to, to, to meet um, Trini. I had the privilege of meeting her when I visited the IAU uh, at the UNESCO offices in Paris in June this year. And she gave me a tour of the many groundbreaking projects she leads and supports and gave me a sense of how we at UKZN can be admitted into the global networks, especially in the field of global or digital transformation. Trini, thank you very much for graciously accepting our invitation to be part of this conference. Please, won't you, sh won't you share your thoughts and experiences on teaching and learning in a rapidly transforming world? Trini, to you. Thank you very much, Ruby, for this introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this important conference. And I want to congratulate the university on organizing these encounters and having these conversations, which I think is highly important. So, Ruby, it was a pleasure meeting you and learning about the university while you were here in Paris. I wish that I could be there with you in South Africa. I would rather be there than in Paris but I'm also grateful that it is possible for us to, to communicate and collaborate also when we're not together in the same physical space. So thanks a lot uh, to, to you, Ruby, and to the entire team for your support and for setting up this important event. And um, it is my pleasure to contribute with some of our thoughts on what is happening. Um, as Ruby was explaining, uh, I work for the International Association of Universities, and I'll just take a few minutes to introduce our work in order to situate you uh, in the context from where I am speaking. So let me see if I can advance the slides. Yes. So, so the International Association of Universities, as Ruby was explaining, is an association that is that exists since 1950. It's an independent, non-governmental organization, but we were set up and created by UNESCO back in 1915 to foster collaboration among universities around the world. And that key mandate have actually remained stable over time, 
although of course the societal context is changing. What we do is that we foster collaboration among members and we have some member, some 600 members situated in 120 countries around the world. Uh, and we do this type of collaboration through different thematic priorities that the, that the association is placing focus on. Before going a little bit more into detail with that, I also want to mention, because I think it's an open and interesting resource that you might be interested in, that the IAU is also updating the World Higher Education Database, which is an online portal that is composed of more than 20,000 higher education institutions around the world. And our team is making the data available, verifying that it's only accredited higher education institutions with at least a four year cycle degree. Uh, so maybe not all higher education institutions, but at least with this criteria that is available in this database. And I think it's an interesting tool to kind of get insight in what type of universities are existing in different contexts. So it is just an extra resource that I just wanted to draw your attention to here. As Ruby was explaining already, the association is leading several uh, projects and activities. We have a new leadership program for globally engaged leaders. So bringing to get together leadership with insights from different regions of the world in order to favor value-based leadership. We also have several activities and initiatives in the area of internationalization. We have capacity building program that support institutions in developing internationalization strategies, completely customized and tailored to the specific context of the institutions. My colleague Giorgio Marinoni working on this uh, priority is also currently uh, analyzing the data of the sixth global survey on internationalization in higher education. So also we are in charge of monitoring developments. Another area is higher education and research for sustainable development, of course, and a very important agenda to all of us. And what we do here at IAU is again, advocating for the important role of universities and higher education institutions in the pursuit of the sustainable development goals, but also bringing institutions together to share experiences on how to transform in order to maximize the impact of universities in that endeavor. Finally, digital transformation of higher education, the fourth strategic priority of our association. And that is the one that I'm leading and that I'm going to um, speak to you about here today. I will give some examples in the end of the presentation of the different initiatives that Ruby was referring to in the introduction. But I thought that um, I would first start uh, with a little bit of a different kind of approach uh, compared to Jin, who took us really into the, 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 the specificities of examining how can we actually engage and use AI. And Jin, congratulations. I found your talk extremely <laughs> inspiring and, and motivating. I have not focused in my presentation on AI, but I do have a few slides in order to discuss this topic. And I hope to bring in some other perspectives as well that could maybe create some kind of a dialogue about how to use these tools in teaching and learning. So let me just go over very quickly how I have planned to proceed for this presentation. As we are an NGO based at UNESCO and also working with the UN, I thought I would bring in a few thoughts and trends in terms of what is happening when discussing digital transformation in teaching and learning at the UN level. What are the visions that are being set out? What are the different instruments that are also impacting the way that we shape teaching and learning? So that's what I'm going to bring in in my first part. In the second part, I will use some of the information that we've been collected, collecting as an association, IAU, from universities around the world 
to kind of give you insight in how the landscape in teaching and learning have been shifting. So I'm going to take more a helicopter view and get you to travel a little bit back in time and then forward to where we are today, but also hopefully get you to travel a little bit around the world, see some of the different challenges and opportunities that are being identified by our members around the world. Then, as I said, a few slides on generative AI to also see, okay, this is something that is very much uh, on the, uh, the a bus uh, in uh, conversations at the moment. And I hope to bring in a few additional uh, perspectives for the discussions here. And then finally, in the last part, I'll give some examples of the work that IAU is doing in order to support its members in continuously developing and transforming not only teaching and learning, but higher education. So let's go into the first part. Um, last year, uh, the UN Secretary General um, convened the Transforming Education Summit. And I think that it was convened with the specific purpose of really raising the political commitment and, uh, and and education on the political agenda overall at the highest level um, at UN. Of course, it's also with a view to mobilize financing, which is, of course, crucial in order to have strong education sector, not only focusing on higher education, but the full spectrum from primary to secondary to tertiary education, etc. But what I found interesting to bring in here is from the vision statement that came out of this summit uh, from last year, because they are looking at what it means to learn in today's world. And I think that when we think about how we use technology, of course, it should support the way that we want our learners to learn. So I found that it was interesting to bring in their concepts in terms of what it means to learn in today's world. So it's divided in four different ways of learning. Learning to learn to equip every learner with literacy, numeracy, and digital critical skills, scientific thinking, curiosity, create, creativity, social and emotional skills, empathy, and kindness. So that's one part. Not only to digest the information, the knowledge, the facts, but learning to learn to be capable of continuing learning when you exit the education system. Learning to live together, to enable learners to be active and responsible uh, citizens, sorry, <laughs> uh, to build better relations with each other, society and the planet. So it's not only, again, about how you as a learner learn as an individual, but it's also how you're situated among other learners. Learning to do, allow people of all ages to participate in the world of work, um, and in society by skilling, reskilling, and upskilling. So it's a continuous process. And of course, it's also about having the necessary skills to interact in society, whether through work or through other functions. Learning to be, to instill in learners the values and capacities to lead a meaningful life, to enjoy that life, and to live it fully and well. So there are different aspects that come across the 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 idea of learning and the responsibility of higher education institutions that goes beyond the different disciplines the different subject matters of course that you need to convey as uh, professors as teachers and i think that those are important to have at the center when we decide how we use technologies to support the learning process one of the tracks at the uh, at the Transforming Education uh, Summit was specifically focusing on digital learning and transformation. And what came out of it, if it's summarized into just a very brief uh, uh, slide here, is the focus on content, high quality content to made, be made available to all users and staff. A continuous need for capacity building. That's also what we see after coming out of the COVID pandemic and the different experiences there. There needs to be capacity building across the institutions for the uptake and to gain the necessary skills to make use of digital technologies in the teaching and learning process. And then finally, the third C, connectivity. This is also about, again, 
placing it in a context where we are realistic about what is possible in different types of countries, in different types of institutions, taking into consideration as well, of course, the possibilities of students to be able to go online, to have access to the necessary devices, to have access to data. So there are a certain number of aspects that we need to focus on to make sure that digital trans, um, technologies are actually supporting the teaching and learning process. In parallel to this, I also want to highlight the fact that over the past few years, there has been several uh, new normative instruments adopted at UNESCO. And I have highlighted those where I think that there is a specific impact on teaching and learning in higher education, and also to show you what are the different uh, levels of priorities set at the international governmental um, agenda. In 2019, UNESCO uh, adopted the recommendation on open educational resources, inciting, of course, teachers and professors to share their resources in order to have a pool of information available to different parts of the world that can be translated, that can be adapted to different contexts. So there is a move towards the more use and creation of open educational resources. Then another one in 2021, there is a new global recommendation on open science. And although this one, of course, is more specifically related to the science and research agenda of the university, it is intrinsically linked to teaching and learning in the sense that the more open access we have to knowledge, to research productions, the more that will also be able to come and support the teaching and learning process through the different resources that students will have access to. And then finally, and the third recommendation, of course, and here it fits the topic of our first keynote speaker, the recommendation on ethics on the ethics of AI. This recommendation is not specifically on education uh, only. It's a recommendation that considers AI in society in general, of course, with some recommendations to uh, AI in education. But I think that it's important to be aware of because I do think that if we are able to stand behind some core principles and values in the use of AI, then I do believe that we can make positive use of it in teaching and learning. But we also need to be very aware that with every new type of technology, there are risks associated to it. So I do think that if we stand behind certain commonly adopted principles and values, then we can limit the risk and maximize the opportunities that those tools are offering. I will not go into details with these tools, but I, of course, invite you to consider reading these resources because I do think that they are um, aspirational in terms of the world that we wish to create now that we have access to different digital technologies. Another resource that I wanted to put on the table here, looking at it for, from the very global perspective, is the new UNESCO Global Monitoring Report from 2023. And the reason why I mention it here is because they have placed in this report specific uh, focus on technology in education, a tool on whose terms. And while again, this report is mainly focusing on primary and uh, secondary education, there are also references to higher education in there. And there are a few things that are, in, that are interesting in the way that they have set up the report. So I brought in this uh, um, short quote here that you see on the screen, because I think that it highlights many of the different tensions and um, aspects that we need to keep in mind when we take decisions about how we integrate technology in teaching and learning. The read report underscores the importance of learning to live both with and without digital technology, to take what is needed from an abundance of information, but ignore what is not necessary, to let technology support but never replace the human connection on which teaching and learning are based. The focus should be on learning outcomes, not on digital inputs. 
To help improve learning, digital technology should be not a substitute for, but a complement to face-to-face -face interactions with teachers. And I think that this summary explaining the scope of the report is interesting because it highlights the fact that it's not only about taking everything that is impossible that is possible and integrate it into teaching and learning but really make sure that what is the purpose of learning what are the outcomes we want to achieve and how can technology and learning uh, and digital tools support that process in this report there were three main aspects that were highlighted for higher education institutions as um, positive developments using digital technologies. One are flipped classrooms are changing instructions in higher education. So this move towards more blended learning that we are seeing in many higher education institutions around the world. It also opens up for new forms of international collaboration through um, uh, international um, uh, classrooms, uh, for integrating, for example, different instructors from different institutions in, in, in teaching and learning. So I think that it is also opening up new doors for international collaboration. And then the third thing that was highlighted as a main um, positive development is that uh, uh, laboratory infrastructure is being expanded while being able to use digital uh, technologies. So this, to sum up this first part on the overall global part, I think that we need to have really at the center what it means to learn, what is our vision for teaching and learning, and then be very uh, aware of the different trends uh, that are impacting us, whether it is from the set of the normative instruments that I highlighted, whether it's the, the learning process of what came out of the pandemic that informs the way forward. So this is important when we take decisions about how we shape the future of teaching and learning. Now, moving to my second part, I wanted to introduce to you some of the information that we have gathered as IAU and published in, in, in a series of reports. And you will see um, on the on the left hand side, you have we have our first uh, global survey reports uh, on the state of digital transformation in higher education. It was um, we collected the data in 2019 and published the report in 2020. So just prior to the lockdowns with the COVID pandemic, a very difficult time to launch such a report, but at the same time, an interesting report to have to show kind of where we were before the pandemic started. In the middle, you see another uh, type of report where we were looking at how universities were operating during the pandemic. And then the final report on your right hand side is a qualitative um, follow up project to that um, the second report in the middle, uh, looking at how universities are then reopening their campuses again and what does it mean for the future of teaching and learning. So I've decided to pick a few examples in all three of these reports to show you what has been happening over time. And before I go into them, I just want to show you some kind of a mind map of what I, I find that we are seeing across these three reports. And that is that our reliance of on uh, digital tools and even our uh, opportunities for exploring the, the, the potential of digital tools have definitely changed over time. If we go back to the pre-COVID pandemic in the first report I was referring to, you will see that very few institutions were making that much use of digital technologies. There were very little um, um, well, not that many institutions were, for example, making use of online or remote uh, education opportunities. Then we moved into the pandemic where with no choice, the majority of institutions had to shift to a complete opposite configuration where they had to operate 
only remotely without the necessary planning, without the necessary time to actually set up instructions to be delivered remotely. Uh, so there we went into a very high uh, mode of reliance of digital tools to be able to actually continue the mandate of the higher education institutions. And then now in the post lockdown situation, I think we're still classified as a pandemic. Otherwise I would like to say post pandemic uh, situations, we are looking at how universities now are finding their way in this changed environment, learning from the experiences during the pandemic to identify and to decide how to move forward. And of course, there's not any surprise to see that this is happening in very different ways and um, across the different not only countries, but also the different uh, institutions. So I think that we are moving into an even further diversified higher education landscape with a lot of interesting initiatives. So let's dive into a few examples of these three reports and then um, um, see where we are at. So, so now I make you travel back in 2019, the report that we did before the pandemic. And I'm only going to use one single graph from this report. It's not going to be a long presentation, but I found interesting to bring in this slide where we were, or this graph where we were asking our respondents, the universities, to identify the main obstacles to digital transformation in higher education institutions. And across the different regions, you see that the main barrier is the financing. It's the financial costs related to actually making use of these tools. In second is the cultural change within institutions. So actually supporting the, 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 the necessary change within very traditional ways of operating within um, the different higher education institutions. Third, the lack of interest from certain faculty or staff. Um, to some extent as well, the need of capacity building. And here Africa stands out even more prominently than in, in other regions of the world. And then of course, as well, um, the, the fact that in order to make use of these tools, you need reliable internet connections. I find this one interesting in the sense that if we look at where we stand now in 2023, I do believe that financial cost still remains a main obstacle for many institutions. It is being repeated over and over again that it does take a budget to have the necessary infrastructure. It also means that students need to have access to devices, to data, to be able to actually explore these opportunities. So the financial cost, I think that we are not completely over that obstacle anymore, but maybe with the pandemic, more um, resources are being injected into the system to try to solve it. However, what I do believe is that the pandemic forced universities to test new ways of operating to see what is possible. And of course, because it was done very abruptly with no time for preparation, not everything worked well. But I do think that even if it was maybe not intentional, I think this actually supported a shift towards a more open mindset, towards examining the possibilities of digital tools in teaching and learning. So it has led to increased capacity building. It has also led to more awareness about where infrastructure has to be improved in order to make this happen. So, so let's move forward now to 2021, uh, where we then collected data during the pandemic. So one year into the pandemic of where universities stood. So in the 2019th report, we had more or less 60% uh, of the respondents saying that only less than 10% of their programs were offered online. So, and actually overall 30% of the institutions offered no online learning. So two years later, we had the same type of questions where 89% of the higher education institutions confirmed that they had shifted to remote teaching and learning. Of course, under the constraint of the pandemic, but still very interesting. 
We also asked not only to what extent that they were offering these opportunities, but also to what extent that they're actually able to reach out to the students. And still here, we have quite a good outreach with 86 at the global level. But then when we go into the details and ask the institutions, so how many of the institutions are actually able to reach out to the full body, I mean, of students, here, the number starts to fall only 27% at the global level, a little more in Europe, that is 39%, and only 14% in Africa. However, if we turn it around and look at how many are reaching less than 50% of their student populations, we see only 10% at the global level, maybe. But we do see that almost a quarter of the institutions that responded in Africa said that they were able to reach uh, less than 50% of their student populations through remote teaching and learning during the pandemic. It is, doesn't mean, of course, that we should not use digital technologies, but I think it's also about knowing the context, knowing the realities in order to be able to see how do we make sure that we reach our students and make sure that we offer the best quality possible, taking into consideration the context in which we are operating? A second slide from this report, uh, where we were looking at to what extent that um, universities were increasing their use of digital tools in higher education. And there, to no surprise, you see that it is exploding across uh, the different types of options that we, we gave. Um, so we clearly saw that a shift from our 2019 report, where there were less engagement with digital tool tools to a very steep uh, increase during the pandemic. Now, in our third report, uh, we were looking at, we are, now we are moving to 2022, so at a time where campuses were opening again, and we were asking institutions, so how are you now ex using this experience to move forward, to design teaching and learning um, in this new context where we can again access campus, but we also have an experience coming out of the pandemic using uh, digital tools. And we do see a clear trend in terms of a move towards more blended learning and flipped classrooms. And you have examples here in the quotes, um, how the institutions, whether in Mexico, whether in Italy or in, in China, are saying that these experiences actually we're contributing to building the skills of our staff and give new opportunities in the teaching and learning and the different modalities uh, being implemented. So it has created a more diversified pool of opportunities when um, teaching and learning uh, or when designing teaching and learning. And I mean, as said by the in the last quote, Blended learning has become, in many institutions, a more default pedagogical model. Another example of trends that we see coming out is that some institutions are using educational platforms differently in terms of their uh, teaching and learning. So connecting to other types of platforms with access to information. This is, again, a question of strategy, to what extent you want to be able to build, contextualize the content, the curricula, or to what extent there are certain aspects that can also be relevant uh, in other, um, I mean, from courses offered by other institutions. But this is a different trend that we have been observing among universities making more use of those types of global platforms. It has advantages and disadvantages, of course. Then we also see a change in the demand of the students that having going back to campus after the pandemic, there is an increased demand from students in this type of flexibility to be able to compose how you want to receive your learning, whether it is on campus, whether it's uh, online. So it pr puts another type of pressure on universities to offer these more flexible learning pathways through the higher education uh, experience. We also saw in some of the examples that the pandemic has maybe also pushed us to see that there is sometimes 
very um, um, what do you say a high difference between the ambitions of an institutions and what is actually the possibility that we see in many uh, university strategies very high ambition goals about using technology within teaching and learning, but without actually having the necessary infrastructure and the means to, to actually implement those goals. So I think it's also a learning process in terms of being very conscious about what is possible in a given context. We also see institutions that are uh, deciding uh, that maybe it was forced to go online during the pandemic, but it does not necessarily mean that this needs to be a modality of delivery after the pandemic. So there are very various reactions to the experience around the world. This, this final quote that I brought in from Japan, I found very interesting. And it's also um, something that I continuously hear uh, in conversations with members from around the world. This idea of being able to see certain parts of the learning can actually be um, transferred or used remotely, whereas other parts such as the social interactions, the social dimensions can be further emphasized when on campus. So really trying to see what are the added value of the different learning modalities and how do I construct my teaching and learning around that. So here in Japan, the example that they're giving is that the lecturing part, the knowledge transfer, they're using much more online learning, making those types of information available through video where students could potentially hear the, the lecture several times and then almost sometimes redesigning the campuses for more social interactions when they bring together the, the students on campus. So to sum up a bit, I think that the pandemic has led to a change in mindset and more openness towards breaking with certain uh, tradition. It doesn't mean that the pandemic, that everything that was carried out was optimal. I mean, I think that it was amazing to see how universities were able to adapt very quickly to a very difficult situation. And really, we saw how much faculty was investing extra time to make this happen, to ensure that the learning process can continue for the students. But then, of course, it's important to evaluate the experience, to keep what worked, and then leave aside what did not work. I think that we have also established that we need continuously capacity building. This is also what you do here with the conference. I think that is also the role of your office, Ruby, to continue to have these conversations and to make sure that staff has access to those types of capacity building opportunities. I think we need to be aware of the fact that students will continue to uh, familiarize themselves with digital technologies at a very fast pace so pace so by default this will also pose some type of pressure uh, pressure on institutions to respond and adapt to the the demands from the students however i also think that it's important to underline that the pandemic also kind of stressed the important social mission of universities so beyond the formal curricular that campuses is a social experience for students where they come together and they, they learn, they debate, they exchange beyond the actual teaching and learning. And to some extent, sometimes we heard in many uh, of our conversations with members that sometimes campus is also a place that levels inequalities, whereas unfortunately, sometimes the digital means further ex uh, exacerbate the inequalities because there are differences in terms of to what extent students have access to those. So, so I think we also see a trend towards actually rethinking the design of campuses to further emphasize the social dimension when on campus and then seeing how to use digital tools to support the learning um, that goes beyond campus. 
So, so overall, I think that this also leads to a diversification of the higher education landscape that institutions need to profile themselves. You do not necessarily need to be everything, but you need to see, okay, what is the specific scope of my institutions? And then how do we wish to cater to our students, to our learners in order to offer them the big experience? And of course, quality must be at the heart of that decision. So, so just now moving to my third part, we do not have any data collected on generative AI yet. So what I wanted to bring into this conversation before I end my talk is um, some outcomes of a webinar that we organized not so long ago uh, here at IAU, and it's available if you're interested on our YouTube channel. We brought in three experts for a conversation about how AI is impacting higher education. And of course, there were a lot of different things said in that um, session, but I think that I just want to extrapolate three core messages that I share with you here. And that is when using AI in higher education, I think it's essential to understand potential and limitations. Because I think you were saying as well, Jin, this kind of dichotomy between human and the machine. But I think that this is exactly what is so interesting when we have these new developments that kind of imitates capabilities of humans that then also points to questions about what does it mean to be human? What are we? What role in society? And how do we interact with these tools, these machines? So I think that it is important, of course, to have these reflections, to discuss it and to see how to actually explore the potential. But I also think that it's very important that we continue to be aware that we are engaging with a machine. It is not a human, but it's very, very good at imitating human capabilities. I think that is also very important for higher education institutions to have conversations about some of the limitations with institutions so that they understand that it is, of course, impressive to see the speed at which generative AI is producing uh, content, but it is also important to know that it is not necessarily capable of understanding the, the content it's producing and to verify the, the, the veracity of the information. So I think that that should form part of the learning process to have critical thinking so that students are able to not necessarily just take it as a fact but to question it and to be able to see what, one, what is the, the truth and what is maybe disinformation. I think that um, what we have seen among um, many higher education institutions is this question about should we be banning or embracing generative AI? And what came out of our conversation in this webinar is that it is actually more or less impossible to ban its use. It forms part of society. It's already being integrated in different tools that we have. Um, but I think that it is important to Dis to, to discuss how to frame the use so that it's being used for good. Jim, Jim was giving several examples of that, but also make sure that students are aware of what is good use and what is misuse. Uh, for example, plagiarism could be one where we are used to refer to plagiarism when a human uses another human text without proper uh, referencing or citation, all of a sudden this concept is actually also expanded to machine production. So I think this is where we have to be very clear about the, 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 the ethical part. So to emphasize academic and, uh, integrity and ethical conduct, if we put that at the center, then I think we can actually use tools like this and support the learning process here. Now, the final thing I want to mention on, on AI, it's about the data. I think, Jin, you were saying the same thing. Um, it is, to some extent, biased information. And we do know that the quality of the output that comes out of ChatGPT depends very much about uh, on the digital output that it has access to. And this output is human created. So I think that we also need to, to emphasize that when we need to continuously, as human, produce knowledge that informs those systems, because otherwise, 
I mean, the, the worst scenario was to, would be to imagine some kind of a stagnated uh, state of knowledge being reproduced in different forms of text over and over again. So we have to remember that chat GPT only works well when it's informed by the knowledge generated by humans. And it will only be relevant over time if we continue to feed it with that type of information. So I think that it's important and we should be aware that there are problems with the data. Data set. We have problems with the, um, the diversity and fair representation, but that's not only a problem related to generative AI, it's a problem in terms of research production overall that is not necessarily fairly representing all countries and cultures and languages of the world. So I think that is also an important part to underline when using it. Um, in higher education. So these, so these are the three things that I wanted to, to, uh, to highlight. Let me go very quickly through some of the, the things that we have been doing at IAU. I think I'll be very brief, but we did launch last year a new policy statement where we tried to kind of synthesize what are the key values and principles that we believe are important uh, to underpin higher education pursuing digital transformation. So I invite you to read that through that one and comments would be, be very welcome. Uh, we continue to monitor trends as I was giving some of the examples from our reports and it's my pleasure to let you know that we are actually in the midst of designing the next global survey that will be launched in um, in 2024, we will be collecting data. So normally in 25, we will have a new report on the state of digital transformation around the world. We continuously have these types of debates and we I'm just um, giving you one example of a webinar series that we co-created with the Open University of uh, Catalonia. And what I found interesting here is that we brought together online, fully online universities and campus-based universities for conversations about where we are going in terms of teaching and learning, in terms of assessments, in terms of data governance, etc. So you have those types of resources at our website as well. We launched the institutional site visits as Ruby was referring to in his introductions, and we had a visit at the Open University of Catalonia focusing specifically on what it takes to do online teaching and learning. Our next inter institutional site visit will place focus on open science and what it takes for institutions to implement and support the movement towards open science. And that one is coming up in April next year, in case anyone is interested in that topic. We also have an expert group on that matter, again, to support, to bring together the voices of higher education institutions from different regions of the world and to, to, to debate, to share experience, to ensure this knowledge transfer uh, among the different regions of the world in order to support the implementation of open science. And in Ruby, I think now I have use all my time i hope not too much um but i want to thank you again for this opportunity to share our experience here from the side of iau and i want to also inform you that this year we are meeting at the university of qatar for our annual event at iau where we are placing focus on higher education with impact the importance of intercultural learning and dialogue so if this is a topic that is of interest, in, of interest to you, you're very welcome to join us in Doha in November. So with that, I say thank you. And I hand it over again to you. Big representation of your global experience, particularly of digital transformation. And you jolted our memory, you reminded us of several important learnings, particularly the rapid adoption of digital tools and the phenomenal migration to online and blended um, tech, uh, learning. And your, your comment that online learning has now become the default pedagogic model. You also reminded us of the demand from students for flexible curriculum offerings, alerting us to the need for innovation, which is what we've been talking about today. And innovation can only be achieved 
if we break or at least depart from traditional rituals and refocus the social mission of universities and recenter students as the center of our universe. Thank you, Trini. Um, the, I will forward the invitation to the conference in Qatar to, the, to this team, and hopefully some of them can find their way to that conference. Thank you, Trini. Uh, we have literally two minutes for the next session. So once again, unfortunately, I'm going to have to forego, forego the Q&A session, but I think it was equally useful to, to listen to Trini share global experiences. Thank you very much. Can I now call the panel, please, to take up the positions here? And while they take up the positions, I want to introduce you to the chair of this panel, who actually requires no introduction, Mr. Badru. And many of you will remember Badru as a young man of only a few years ago who came to UTLO as an intern. And he has grown in stature, in leadership capacity, intellectual capacity, and he is now a highly respected member of the teaching and learning portfolio. Thank you very much, Padru. I hand over the mic to you now. Thanks, um, Prof. D, as I do call him. Um, good morning, colleagues. All protocols do and well observed. Um, as Prof. has introduced, I am Abdubaki Badru. Um, popularly known as Badru, <laughs> instead of, yeah, I just make it so easy for people to call me, so I say, just call me Badru. And um, I will be your, um, the chair for this session today. Um, I have here distinguished panel members. We would be discussing um, a very important topic, which is on um, intentional design. And basically the title of our engagement is Crafting the Future of Higher Education, the power of intentional design. We would explore the synergy between intentional design and higher education. Um, in my panel here, I have teaching and learning leader, I have um, technology advocates, I have um, educators and designers, and, and as you, I'm sure you would agree with me that that's a very dynamic um, um, group to bring together. Also, we have, um, I would say a language professional, practitioner. Um, let, uh, just to introduce everyone here, from my left here, I have uh, Mr. Mkati. Mr. Mkati um, Kubulani he is the acting director of um, our university language planning and development office. We have um, next is uh, Mrs. Ishana Gangaram. She is an instructional designer in the College of Health Science. Next, um, I have well, the popular um, Prof. Jean, our keynote speaker from the United States. And then I have um, Prof. Ruth Hoskins. Prof. Ruth Hoskins, she's, she's the Dean of Teaching and Learning in the College of Humanities. Um, so I will be starting my engagement with them where we would um, look at how in intentional design is um, essential you know, in the future of higher education in our teaching, in the way we assess our students. Um, and um, please, can I have one more mic? Thank you. OK, to kickstart our conversation, um, I would like to, to, to start with well, you might say it's an easy question, but I would say it's not easy. And, and definitely, it's, it's, it is about what is intentional design? Because you see, intentional design spans across different domains. But here in the higher education, what do we mean by intentional design? And how, and how important is, is it you know, in crafting the future of higher education? Um, I would like to open this floor um, to our panel members. We can. I can, anyone could start. Um, maybe I can start with Prof, Prof Ruth Hoskins. 
Well, good morning, everybody, and it's wonderful to be here, to be chatting with you. Um, I think having listened to both keynotes, uh, what is clear is that we have to be intentional in the space of higher education. So it doesn't matter where we are in the space. Um, it's that intentionality that we need to unpack. And I think the two keynote speakers really gave us good contextual backgrounds for where we are. And the interesting data that came out of the presentations and the approach that um, Jin was able to give us needs us to look now in terms of South Africa at a nuanced context. Mm. What I really appreciated was the humanizing approach to higher education. So what's, what this does is it puts the student at the center of this intention. And so if we look at the um, UKZN as a um, case study, for example, it's clear that if we look at the current uh, vision and mission and the strategic plan, our new 10-year plan, which came into being from 2023 this year, the foregrounding of excellence in teaching and learning linked to that is the new strategic goal of an excellent student experience. So the case study of UKZN fits in excellently with that about being intentional in terms of what we do in the higher education space. So the student-centered approach is what is crucial. Um, and when we're focusing on instructional design and being intentional about it, and we're talking about the adoption of innovative technologies in the space, we must not lose fact of the constraints that we've had around higher education in the Southern African context. So if we look at UKZN, and our mission and vision, we've really been intentional about inclusive education. We've been intentional from the get-go around attracting the quintiles one to three students. Now with that, we note that where we've really been challenged in higher education in South Africa is with uh, throughput, right? And essentially also with improving the graduate attributes. Now having said that, the adoption of these innovative technologies throughout our teaching and learning cycle have to then yield a benefit for us, essentially. And what we're finding is, is that we can actually see that benefit if we actually adopt the innovative technologies. So we're looking at the entire teaching and learning cycle. We're looking at digital transformation of the curriculum, and I define curriculum holistically, yeah. We, we had the agenda around decolonizing the curriculum. When we look at that decolonization, the adoption of that innovative technology to facilitate learning and to facilitate teaching is going to be crucial for us. So we're looking forward to um, the development and finalization of the teaching and learning strategy. And from the strategic plan, it is clear that we're going to harness the, uh, those technologies, the appropriate technologies, to ensure with intention that we're going to realize the benefits of a humanistic approach to the graduate that we see. And then my last point, because I know we are limited for time, is around the move to University 4.0. That we have to produce a graduate who's not just knowledgeable, but is also work ready. Right, to make a contribution and a difference to the society. So we're speaking about global citizenship and how we contribute to um, the world at large uh, in terms of our graduates. So no longer can we think about knowledge transfer, but also ensuring that we have uh, our students in terms of the learning outcomes are also achieving critical competencies and skills to make a difference in the workplace. Thank you, Badro. Um, thanks, Prof. Um, I think you, you've really covered a lot there. And looking at it, you, you, you have covered it, especially from a leadership and a strategic point of view. And that definitely gives us an, an, an overview, you know, bad view of 
what intentionality is, you know, when it comes to higher education at that level. And um, I, I, I would like to ask um, um, Prof. Jean, um, from your, um, your own view, you know, intentionality in, in, in higher education, what does that mean and how, how, how do we take this forward? Yeah, that's a great question. I have the same question back. What is intentionality? What is intentional design? Um, every now and then, right, we have these new themes and words coming up. Um, and I always thought design was supposed to be intentional, right? I mean, I don't think anybody designs without intention. But I think there are several things in your response that were really fantastic in having a sense of what it is that we're designing for. This is something that when it comes to this idea of defining intention, understanding what it means, I think is super important. And it comes from our observations of the human first. What are the kinds of issues that are presented? How do we define that issue? And as I hear you speaking about the issues here in South Africa and the kinds of goals that you're thinking of, if I had to describe it, maybe that is a way of talking about intention. The second thing that I was thinking about when it comes to understanding intention is this idea of, okay, it's great to say that we want to be intentional about our design, but what does that concretely mean in terms of the ways in which we act, in the ways in which we set policies, in the ways in which we react to what we have? And so whether we're talking about intentional design or design itself, I think part of the important issue is it really first define the problem correctly, because if you're looking at the wrong problem, all the intention in the world isn't going to help you solve the issues that are going on. Uh, but the second thing is to pay really close attention once we've defined that problem to what is going on in that phenomenon. That's going to require the how and what of us as colleagues coming together at the table to share different kinds of perspectives, to see all the barriers involved in this very complex web of stuff that causes these phenomena that we are reacting to. And finally, it is in some ways proactive and in some ways reactive. Yeah. Intention, I think, isn't just the, un the beginning part where it's like, I have good intent, but it's also the action and follow through of what we do. Are we paying attention to what learners are saying, what the people supporting learners are doing? Are we taking all that into consideration and going through the intentional effort of repeating the process, reiterating, and to constantly learn as we go along this process mm -hmm and to then adjust. And it's through that repetition, I think, that the intention becomes more than just an intention, but also the execution, the, right, the follow through, the effort uh, of the intent. So what is intentional design? I don't know. How do we get there and what do we do? Those are ways in which we might start to define it in more concrete terms. And that's gonna be different for every single kind of problem that we approach. Mm. So there's my non-answer answer. <laughs> no, no, definitely. That's, that's quite interesting because um, what I've picked up from your, your own um, view is about the, the, the intention, attention, and also problem solving. You know, because um, before you can say you're intentional about anything, you need to think about what exactly are you planning to achieve. You know, and that really resonates with, you know, um, when it comes to instructional design, you know, um, and that starts with the planning before you then start, then you go into the design. And, and I think I would like to then put, uh, move on to um, Mrs. Gangaran, who is an instructional design. And my, my question there is, is about um, how can intentional design, because intentional design is, it is a domain, it is a space. Um, how can it actually, um, you know, like the principles in, in, in instructional design, how can we integrate these in our course, you know, um, development to enhance our pedagogical effectiveness, right, and, and then students' engagement? Okay, so um, instructional design is a field, uh, and there's many deliberate strategies uh, and programs, uh, models. So if you take something like backward design uh, as a process, uh, in course development, you could use that uh, as, as, as a you know as a, as a base or a foundation uh, to determine the learning objectives in course development, and then you can tie in from those processes your pedagogical uh, approaches, which also fall into that. So, from instructional design perspective, we um, we don't just um, you know uh, consult with a uh, subject matter expert. There are processes that, as designed, that are intentional and that we use. So the, 
the, with the backward design process, you start with the end goal in mind. So you have a learning objective set out. Then you can determine your, um, your instructional strategies or, and your assessment uh, strategies and your activities. And all of that is then intentional in the way that you're designing. And you have different learner profiles as well that you can set up for your course development because our students now are uh, uh, from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, also, you know, the, the experience that they bring. So all of that intentionality has to be put into the course development from an instructional design perspective. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Mrs. Gangaram. I think that that's that's really um, it, it shows definitely that you are on the ground, like you you are working with the with the lecturers, you know, to to get them where they should be. Maybe not where they want to be, but where they should be, because um, now you you're trying to walk them through the process, and and it definitely shows that um, syste being systematic is part of intentionality, because you have to go from a, a phase to the next phase to the next phase, and 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 I think um, moving on to you know, at, at UKZN here, we, 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 when it comes to language, it is a very important part of our teaching. Um, and, and I would like to move on to, to language and how, you know, um, the university um, um, language development office, you know, is how do they see themselves in this space of intentional um, um, design, intentional um, curriculum? Thank you very much, Patru. And, uh Good morning to everyone. Um, from the language uh, point of view, I think uh, we understand intentional design as a systematic approach to the teaching and learning enterprise. And the understanding of teaching and learning enterprise is in such a way that we understand it as a multifaceted enterprise. And our approach to it is that we need to be intentional about who we are in the context of South Africa. And what we have not done correctly is oftentimes we speak among, them, among ourselves and we forget the multifaceted nature of teaching and learning enterprise. And therefore, the first point I think that I want to bring across is that universities have to be intentional about engaging basic education in all what they do. Why is that? It's because we receive when I'm saying we, I'm referring to her education. We receive students from basic education. And oftentimes, there is a misalignment between what we are doing and what they are doing. I do think that, for me, it's, it's important. Then the second point is that South Africa is lucky in a sense that, in terms of legislation, all official South African languages are considered in our constitution. And then in 2020, her education released um, a new revised language policy framework for her education. And all the institutions, including our, our own UKZN, we are working on revising our own language policies because we believe that the enterprise of teaching and learning is not complete without students being able to articulate themselves in classrooms, in, 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 in their own tutorial uh, sessions, in their own mother tongue. But what, what has happened is that we are only pushing it from above. What needs to happen is that there has to be a realignment of policies between uh, basic education and her education in order for us to speak from the same hymn book when we are saying we are promote, promoting the use of indigenous languages um, in her education. The schools themselves are doing the same. We need to be in a position to promote uh, reading and writing right from the beginning so that when they come to us, they have that appreciation of the importance of their 
African languages. So there has to be that systematic and intentional design that speaks to what we want to do as the overall teaching and learning enterprise. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Yes, I want to add on to okay, that. Sure. The university has adopted a universal design for learning approach. Mm. So that is itself is intentional. Uh, and in terms of uh, instructional designers uh, designing courses, we, um, you, we make it accessible in terms of multiple uh, forms of representation, mm. engagement, action, and uh, expression. Um, so it's even also adaptable for people with uh, disabilities. Uh, so like things like closed caption, uh, offering the course in Isizulu and English, um, those are all intentional design principles mm. that we in, uh, in come, well, take on in our instructional design process. Thanks. Um, uh, Pr Prof. Jim? <coughs> I'd like, also like to add to this. As I'm listening to my colleagues speak about intentional design, one of the things I can't help but notice is the lovely different layers whether we're talking about policy high level layer to the student, to the designers, these different layers of people and the work we do, and as we talk about intention, it kind of dawns on me this idea that not only do we need to have intention, but for this to work, our intentions need to be transmitted across these layers and understood. How many of us have ever had intention and goodwill only to be misunderstood, right? Mm. <laughs> and I think for the success, you know, that we are striving for in trying new things um, in technology or daring new ways, right, to debunk old kind of myths and whatever. It takes a village, right, to really let an idea come to fruition. And as I hear my colleagues in you know, this organization talking about the different activities they're doing and how these different layers are supporting each other, I hear I hear the intention echoing, right? And this agreement that we're all facing this singular goal and working from these different perspectives. And so to kind of wrap up my thoughts, yeah, intention and design is important, but just as important is that consideration of who is listening to and interpreting that intention and are we aligned in that way? I could just piggyback on that. Um, the one space where I think we've really seen um, um, a major improvement um, with the adoption of um, innovative technologies has been the space of student engagement. Mm -hmm. And I think Chen's point's about, you know, we can be intentional as leadership, you know, um, as the Senate, in terms of what we want to achieve. But if we're not engaging, um, and our engagement strategies are not in place, then we, our intention, okay, is null and void. Mm. So foregrounding the student voice, the ability to actually now use those communication channels, um, using the new technology, that is the one space that even after COVID, looking at uh, the previous presenter, where we've really monopolized that space. I don't know how many of us have now decided that the best way to communicate with our students is no longer email. We've migrated. We are no longer, we're using the social media platforms, utilizing them to improve that engagement. Yes, we're not where we should be, but we have harnessed that benefit of using those um, platforms to improve student engagement. I admit there's still a lot to be done, in terms of where we want to be with the uh, student engagement profile, but it's going to be crucial for mm. us to actually realize the benefits of the intention. Mm. Okay, yeah, you can. Just uh, but to add on what Prof is saying, I think what we need to be intentional about is also capacity building, because the way COVID forced us to react needed us to think back and say, out of our reaction, what is it that we may have done wrong? Mm -hmm. I do think that we need to capacitate our lecturers to handle the online teaching, to handle the online assessment, even to handle the, 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 the overall teaching and learning uh, approach 
to technology because oftentimes you would find that students would look for easy ways of passing through defaulting on a number of things that they would ordinarily not do if we were still using our face-to-face -face, or if we were using only our face-to-face -face approach as it were before. And therefore, it's important for us to capacitate the lecturers as well as the students themselves. And then secondly, from a language point of view, there is a misnomer that um, the language policy framework that we are talking about that uh, says to her education institutions they must at least develop two indigenous languages is that we are saying lecturers themselves must be multilingual. No. It's not to say lecturers must be multilingual, but we are saying lecturers must be capacitated to handle multilingual classes. Therefore, it means that the university or universities have the responsibility to train lecturers in multilingual pedagogies. And therefore, it means that they need to be able to allow organized chaos during tutorials or during their lecture sessions. And therefore, our emphasis is on capacitating lecturers to handle multilingualism as opposed to forcing them to be multilingual because it may not be possible to do that. So I wanted to bring that across so that uh, perhaps it clears the misnomer that there is an expectation that lecturers all of a sudden in their, at their age, they must be multilingual. Thank, Thank you. you, yeah. <laughs> um, that's, 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 quite, that's quite interesting and, and I would say that um, just Based on the conversation we just had, it's, you, you guys have said a lot. Um, you know, you've covered um, you know, language and cultural inclusivity. You kind of like touched on the, you know, the curriculum because when you talk of intentional design, you need to think about intentional curriculum. Um, also, I think one part that I would like us to, to, to talk more on is assessments. We haven't touched on assessments, and I do know that um, you know, when you look at um, the way technology is changing the status quo and how we are adopting technology, it definitely has its impact on our assessment methods. So what, um, when it comes to intentionality, how do we bring in um, the new methods of, of assessment? How do we accept these, these new forms of using technology to assess our students? Uh, maybe you want to um, talk more or have a conversation on that. Yeah, I think... Uh assessments um, are on the way out, basically, uh, from my perspective. Uh, students are looking for more authentic experiences when assessing. They want to mirror real life situations. Mm -hmm. they, when, um, you know, when, when you speak to students, they want something that would engage them um, rather than just a piece of paper and writing down stuff. So uh, assessments should be thought of more in terms of interactions. Um, so I'll just, because of instructional design, we look at scenario-based learning, we look at simulations, we look at role plays. These are things that would get students more involved in, in, um, in their actual subject area. Uh, it gives them a more realistic and, uh, uh, expectation of what to expect in the work environment. So I think that in terms of that, they would have uh, a better um, understanding of the work that they're learning if they assist in ways that are more realistic. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other thing is that we've come across platforms uh, like PSSEPTIV, uh, which is for uh, peer assessment and self-assessment. So um, these platforms are out there and they are set up for students to do uh, peer assessment amongst their, their work and self-assessment. And I think that these platforms are also integrated into the LMS. So now those would give, uh, give lecturers a better you know, opportunity to create uh, assessments that would be more in line with what the students want. And I think, as Jin has explained, that where you have this rhetorical way of answering uh, the questions with chat GPT, if you're doing peer assessment and self-assessment and students are being asked to reflect and, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, discover new things about what their projects or their assignments were, then they would enhance on that learning. So I think authentic assessment is a, is a way that we should be thinking. Okay, um, okay, pro okay. Is it okay? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I mean, everything you're saying, I absolutely think it's important. Um, we have to be intentional um, about what it is that we're trying to assess, right? Are we trying to get them to memorize dates and facts and whatever? or put things together and synthesize new things. And this is gonna require us not just to understand what kind of learning is involved, but what kinds of technologies are the ones appropriate to bring that kind of thing out to the surface for us to take a look at, to understand what's going on inside people's heads. So that's the first thing. I'm glad to hear that it seems like we're doing a lot of work in that area. The second thing I kinda of wanna raise is this idea that students, learners, need to understand that what they are being assessed with aligns with what they are taught or told they're supposed to learn. We can be intentional about trying to teach them these kinds of ways of thinking or skills or values or whatever, but if at the end of the day it's a multi-choice quiz that tests what do you, definitions do you remember or not, that misalignment, I mean, learners are not dumb, right? They will quickly understand what the game is and that puts into jeopardy all of our intention, this misunderstanding of what the intention is. And finally, the one thing that I find really heartening is this idea that you know, for us to be able to come up with these new assessments with technology aligned with what we want people to be learning, it takes these different layers of an institution to be okay with that, right? If we're saying process is important, so we want to go portfolios. We want to hear how people are articulating their ideas and not just the end product as a representation of their thinking, but how it is and why it is they came to that point, right? That's great at the classroom level, but if at the top down, this is not gonna help us or whatever, it all falls apart. And so it's a dialogue, I think, of intention and understanding that has to happen at every level. And as I see our fellow colleagues talking in these ways, nodding their heads, that's a good start, and it's very promising to hear. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Prof. Jean, and I, I would say it's, it's quite interesting to see, you know, the alignment between different people at different levels, because that is exactly what we want to see. We do not want the leaders to be saying something different, and then those on the ground implementing these policies or these strategies are saying something different. So, and, and I would say that um, the aspect of, you know, using technology, we need to you know, think about yeah, this technology, how do we embrace it to achieve our, our objectives? Because it's, it, it, we shouldn't put the technology first. We should put education first, right? And then technology is there to either enable or to support the process. And I, I, I think that's just the, maybe the principle that we should adopt when, when it comes to um, technology and in, in the space of our education. I'm just, in the interest of time, um, I would like to pose the last aspect, which is we have been talking about the opportunities, you know, yeah, intentional design, this is what and what it would help us to do, improve engagement, but let's talk about the, the, the challenges, because definitely if you want to change, you know, change could be difficult at times. So what are some of the challenges that you think we would, we would encounter towards this part of intentional design in, the institu in our institution? Prof? Okay. okay, so the first challenge for me is bringing everybody with you. Mm. Convincing the average academic that there are benefits. And the classic example that we just spoke about now is we had COVID, they had no choice, we had no choice as academics. Mm. We had to flip the switch, mm. off we went. Okay, we did <laughs> on-the-spot training. Uh, we got ourselves going very well. We saw the LMS increase, so all the stats that we see in the benefits. We overcame some of the challenges that we still speak about. And then after COVID, we see, as in um, the previous speaker, Trin, how we taper off and we start going in our own direction. And everybody says, please can we have the three hour sit down exam, right? As a summative assessment. So where are these benefits that we were just speaking about, right? So for me, the crucial thing is we have to, I think, whether you're in a leadership position uh, or not, the capacitation, all right, 
and not because they're forced to do it, but they clearly need to understand where the benefit's going to be and how it's going to impact on the module that they deliver first and foremost. So there's got to be a lot of intentional winning over, however we do it, however we want to strategize, okay, to get people to come along to realize that there really are benefits. What we see with the challenges that we had in the past, we can go back to the challenges around access, internet connectivity, who the students are, they lack the digital literacy, our academics not fully capacitated and prepared for the adoption, the fact that we're still operating very much like we are teaching, you know, in an environment that does not have the necessary tools when, and, and the adoption of those tools are slow in certain spaces. Just a, a classic example uh, would be that this is not unique only to us. Mm. What we saw from a governance, those people who are in governance uh, and are looking at governance of higher education institutions is that the people who make the decisions like the senates are senior academics. They are less likely to want to go and flip the switch. Whereas the younger academic, yeah. okay, embraces the change and the opportunity to develop and grow. Mm. So some of the challenges are really around who we are mm. as an institution and who gets to make the decisions, mm. right? So that for me is the major challenge. Um, the other challenge, of course, is who the student is and how we onboard and prepare that student. And I know we're gonna run out of time to talk about yeah. the first year experience project in South Africa, which I could spend the whole day around but we're doing a lot better understanding who our students are and the context that they come from and what it's going to actually take to transition them to be successful adopting the innovative technologies. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Um, I think I would just like to take the button. Okay. And then I'll, I'll take it. Thanks. Okay. No, no, you can go out there, um, Prof. I think when I talk, think about the challenges, it echoes a lot of what you're saying as well. When I talk to teachers and they're faced with new obstacles or new canyons they need to leap over, part of it, of course, is benefits. Uh, but I would put a nuance to that in we have to be very careful in terms of knowing the difference between telling people what the benefits are in getting people to believe mm. that it will benefit them and their work. And in a lot of the design work that I've done, um, you know, when we talk about design and content and stuff, that's of course important. But this idea of changing people's attitudes about what can be, what is, who they are, is just as important of a learning endeavor. And so I would kind of close this part off with this idea that in order to kind of overcome some of the challenges of adopting new ideas and being intentional, we should be thinking about not just what we are teaching, but who are we teaching to, and who are we trying to get them to believe they can become. That component, I think, can Recording be in progress. that takes these other aspects together and can help them to meaningfully move forward uh, with more autonomy, with more, like, you know, generative thing, inquisitiveness and control over where they want to go, who they want to be. So that's how I would think about it. Thank you very much. Um. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, universities, it's steeped in tradition. So uh, I think the, the challenges are, it's a balancing act basically mm. between preserving academic traditions and adopting uh, innovative ped uh, pedagogical appro approaches. So, um, yeah, that resistance and tension is there, which is a challenge. But I think the opportunity for that is to overcome it with capacity development initiatives, which we are undertaking. Um, and then also, it's, the other challenge is actually understanding our learner profile now in the current space. Um, we have programs, as Prop has said, uh, but um, you know, uh, it's going to take some time to, to, to gather that information. But our learner profile has changed dramatically and, we, and that's a challenge for us when we are doing this designing and, and with the intentionality as well. Um, and then from a grassroots level as the person who does the designing, it's a 
resources, funding is always an issue. So yeah, I don't know how we'd overcome that one. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Mr. Mgadi. Thank you very much. Um, my biggest challenge is what I call politics of education. I think as academics, as people who are in the higher education space, there are certain things that we do not want to pronounce on simply because we want to be politically correct. I do think that we need to explain this, that not everyone is a university material. And we need universities to go out to the public and explain what a university is so that we cannot have these challenges of student strikes that are endless. My issue is that I think universities are not profiling their prospective students enough. And they are not going out there to the communities to explain the difference between the University of Technology and the traditional university and the, the, the TVETs. Then as a result, you end up having students simply because you want to make numbers. But if we are intentional about what we are doing, let's go out there and explain our identity to the communities because now there's free education. Anyone and everyone can come and register. But we need to be in a position to know and to let the public know that what are the attributes of a student that UKZN is looking for. I do think that can go a long way in ensuring that our teaching and learning experiences from both the lecturers and the students uh, are worthwhile. Thank you very much. Um, I think I would like to, um, to just sum up you know, um, what you guys have just explained when it comes to the challenges. And, and I think it's, it's more of like looking at some of the threats, you know, like the political, like you said, the economical. You see, all these, I, I think we, we really need to be intentional even in our strategy, you know, and, and, and taking it down, when you cascade it down to the level of you know, the, the, like those on the ground, the operational part where we then we have the instructional design, we all have to speak the same language. And, and I think with that, what we will be able to adopt the, the aspect of intentional curriculum, intention, adoption you know, of technology, um, bringing in language, you, you spoke about the um, universal design um, 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 principles, you know. So all these, I think we, uh, and that's more of the reason why we do have um, community of practice like this, where we engage, we get to understand, you know, all these principles, all these um, strategies, because if we do not understand this, then we would be doing something different from what, what we are actually expected to do. And um, I think I would want to, I don't want us to have the same you know, session where we do not have um, to engage the, the audience. And I would like to open the floor now. I know I have, say, five minutes, but let's keep it very short. I just want to make sure we engage um, with, the, with uh, our audience on this topic. So um, please, can I have the mic? Can I have them? Yeah, okay. So I'm opening the floor. If you have any questions, comments, please let's keep it very short um, so we can give maybe one or two, three people an opportunity to, to engage with us on this, this, this topic. Morgan Naidu from uh, College of Health Sciences. Uh, the, I mean, the way we designed our curriculum is very modularized, and that doesn't actually make it amenable to uh, portfolio uh, and make it intentional because for more engagement here yeah, it's done in unity in unit sometimes even teachers don't have any idea how your student performed so there's no way of actually because you may pass the module but you may actually not be doing so well in critical foundational concepts that the student needs to build on. And because the whole system is modularized, we, we just go, at the end we complain about the end product. So should we be changing it to include 
the, a portfolio of learning and that we move away from this sort of segmental assessment and move to prog programmatic assessment and we build that into our in uh, intentional designs. Um, thank you very much. Um portfolio of learning and, and this is not the first time I'm hearing that and, and I think that is um, a, a crucial approach you know, when, or a very important approach when it comes to ensuring that our students do understand what they are doing, not, they, not the, them just wanting to pass the assessment for the sake of, of, of getting the marks but you know, being able to, to show and prove that I understand this and this is the application because with the portfolio of learning it's, it's more about application and, and I do agree with you. Um, I was just told by the um, director of proceedings that I, I've been very intentional with, with, with this um, <laughs> and we have enough time you know, to engage more with, with the audience. So I think I still have 10 minutes and I, I, I want to continue with this engagement with, with, with the audience and also um, our panel if you guys want to ask them further questions. Um, okay. okay. So do you have a question there, Christina? Oh, okay, okay. Thank you very much for alerting me. So next we'd have um, our online. Um, please, I would need you to unmute, or you'd, uh, can the person just unmute and then speak? Up? Okay, sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is Elizabeth, and I'm from um, the College of Health Sciences. Um, everyone, the, the, you know, that I've spoken there. I, I just want to, you know, make this comment, you know, in, in terms of um, what I heard just now from, you know, the, the panelists. Um, the the passion for every as teachers to engage. Um, unfortunately, during interviews, we get to find that the passion to engage. Um, so personally. How passionate you are. It's, it's, it's really. Um, we. Um, and to teach the students. Such that, um, please don't get me wrong, they, they have to go. But, but the. To actually. To be able to change, will move to um, how, and I really, but and 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 and, and um, it's also that you have in the class, but being. Um, in a way, forgive me for saying that. Um, but um, in a time, um, I, I have come to realize, and I think it's because of my age, that the old, right, and the young ones, and because of the group, young ones, um, the new learning environment, not only in South Africa, but even across the globe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. And I think this quite resonates with um, our recent engagement on mentorship. When we were saying, um, when we were conceptualizing the mentorship um, program, and initially it was all the, the, the senior lecturers, the professors, are supposed to be the mentors, and then the junior lecturers, the early career academics, should be the mentees. And then we said, no, it could be either way, because looking at the new approach of teaching, technology, the younger ones, so maybe now the, the younger ones could also be mentors to the older ones, because here yeah, they can learn these new approaches, and then it's, it would work hand in hand, because now the older ones understand the pedagogy more, they would help the, 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 the younger ones to then infuse technology in ensuring that you can achieve your pedagogical approach and objectives. And I, I, I would like to open it up if you have maybe one or two maybe um, comments 
with regards to, to, to that. Yeah, no, I would go to the online person. I have time. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I, I know the health science colleagues are well represented today, <laughs> so thanks for that. I think the comment about the learning portfolio is really an important one because it refocuses what we should be looking at in terms of achieving the learning outcomes. And I agree with you when you say, you know, the, the average unit for achieving any learning is past the module, right? But I think especially in um, professional qualifications, if we look at the SACWA descriptor levels, it says at level one of any qualification, whether it's professional or non-professional, there are certain indicators that indicate this is the learning that overall the individual undertaking that qualification should be achieving. So it's a different way of actually how we approach you know, achieving the learning on the qualification. But what we do is we just don't foreground that enough. It's there. We have to be intentional about it when we're actually putting together the course content, funny enough. But as soon as we, uh, we get it approved, it's registered by SACWA, CHE gives us accreditation, we forget about it. We go back in terms of delivery just to teaching on a module and not seeing the scaffolding across the level, okay, in the first year, in the second year, and then overall, you know. Uh, so the idea of the learning portfolio, I think, is a very novel idea, but an excellent idea of how we look at students. And it ties in with the graduate attributes. What do they achieve? Have they achieved the learning? Yes, you pass all the modules, but you graduate with a qualification. So yes, I think very excellent. Um, Observation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just before I go online, another important aspect of, of this debate is the balance between technology and liberal arts. Mm -hmm. I do think that um, universities need to pay attention to that balance because it gives us a student that is grounded. And again, we are talking about two concepts, the internationalization as well as decoloniality. I do think that we need to be very careful in terms of understanding the interface between the two in order for us to make sure that we do not confuse learners. We talk about decoloniality at the same time we're talking about um, internationalization. I do think, think that when we are saying a student has to be an international material, we are saying a student has to be grounded on, on who he is or she is in order for her to contribute meaningfully to the international debate. So the, the, the liberal arts part, I do think that it's important. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to go uh, um, to the person online. Um, please, can you unmute and uh, maybe ask your question or? No, is that online? Is he unmuted? Okay. Um, I'll just read out the question oh, okay. from the Thanks. online colleague. Just let's go. Um, so this is from Reina Abram. And her question is, for sustainability of intentional teaching design, how do you include um, opportunities for feedback and reflection? Mm. Thank you. Um, so I'm opening this up. It's, it's, it's about sustainability and how do we include you know, um, feedback. I, I remember you spoke something about um, the, the um, peer, peer. The peer, yes. Uh, yes. The peer self-assessment. Uh, yeah, the, in, from what I've been reading and, and what I've been exposed to is that uh, we have to be intentional in designing that into our um, assessment criteria. So that's how you can have that sustainability of uh, getting feedback and uh, you know, uh, students can reflect on, on what they've been thought, uh, what their, their responses were, uh, how they were graded. So uh, I think that uh, peer and self-assessment uh, is a very good 
learning tool for the students. That's how I see it. Thank you very much. Um, Prof? Just to add, I think from a quality assurance perspective, regardless of what we do, we've always got to have that underpinning, right? Um, so when we talk about monitoring and evaluation, particularly evaluation, mm. and the ability to get feedback, it goes back to the student-centered approach, that students have to be active participants in the learning, their voice on what we do in the teaching and learning cycle really needs to be foregrounded. It can't be us just dumping everything that we believe, okay, they need, right? They've got to be active participants. They are also part of the knowledge producers. And as you said, it's a two-way, you know, engagement or multiple-way engagement. Yes. We are learning from them. How many of you can sit here and say, I learn so much from my students? True. each time I interact with them, True. right? And because of that, when it comes to opportunities to do the evaluation of what we do, whether they're evaluating us or whether they're evaluating the content, all right, in the course, I think the adoption here again of these innovative technologies, mm. how we structure the curriculum, where we put the badges, mm. where we put the rewards, okay, um, in that instructional design, I'm talking about an online experience yes. now, but what I'm saying is it can be facilitated better when you actually adopt the technology. But again, we'll come back to what Jin was saying about intentionality. We can't just be dumping stuff there, yeah. right? We have seen, again, that there needs to be a change in mindset. Many of us do our student evaluations online. Poor response rates. So what is it, right? So what is it where we've got to make them participate in the learning themselves? So again, it's focusing on the student, mm. which is going to be important and crucial in that environment. Um, thanks, bro. Okay. Also, uh, Basil, I think uh, in intentional design, uh, one of the other parts that we didn't speak about is design thinking. Mm. So exactly. in terms of empathy and yes. ideation, uh, in those processes, they are of that design thinking uh, methodology. You would engage your your uh, co uh, your co-creators and your collaborators. So it gives a platform for everybody to to be involved, to be involved in those ideation sessions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think what what I, I've been able to okay. Um, so what I picked up there is student centeredness. You know, and then you know, looking at. Look, uh, designing around the students, you know, your, 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 your curriculum designing around the students. And this would, would then, um, it's part of what we have also done when it comes to the, in the teaching and learning office, we embrace in as much as most of our services are towards the academics, developing academics, but we, we make sure we include our students. And I think this is something we all need to adopt because they are the, they are the, they are the receiving end. We need to ensure that we are actually giving them what they actually want um, uh, and uh, later um, today, you would see how we are incorporated our student voice, you know, their voices in this community of practice where we will be presenting our students' um, winners where they were trying, where they, they, they had indicated how they think our lecturers should teach. Or if they are lecturers, this is how I would teach. Maybe till we get there, don't let me <laughs> spoil the old moment. Okay, um, just the last question, or maybe comment. Thanks, Badru. And thank you so much to the panelists as well for a really interesting discussion. So the question I, I'm wondering is that how, how, in addition to changing our mindsets as the, as the teachers, how do we also then align our to what we're doing in our innovative spaces of learning? Because no matter what, assessment drives learning. And if we're not going to align our assessment policies and strategies to align with all of this innovative um, differences that we're doing, including bringing the student voices into assessments. So I want the panelists can share with us some strategies about how we actually align our policies to be in line with these innovative thinking spaces that we're creating for learning. Thank you. Thanks. Um. Okay. Oh, I, I just got thrown under the bus. <laughs> That is an amazingly difficult question to answer, right? Um, I think in the conversations that we've had, we've talked about how 
for this alignment to happen, it really takes understanding and agreement at these multiple, multiple levels. And, you know, these stakeholders in the system are connected to other institutions and other forces that are also hard to change. So, you know, in terms of strategy, right, I mean, we each come in with a certain insight, but we're all trying to move this boat together. I only really come in with an expertise with, at the ground level and the teaching level. But when it comes to policies, or when it comes to policies above that, of the state or the government, it's like, I'm not an expert. And so the humble kind of answer to that is one, I don't know what the exact strategy is, but, I know I'd be a rich man if I did know the answer, but I guess the only thing we really can do is come to the table and share with our colleagues what it is, the little thing in our little world that we can do. And that conversation, I think, is really the only starting point for this. Once we kind of understand where we see you know, the gears and the valves, only then can we start to make small incremental changes. And I guess the second strategy that I would put to this is, and this is good advice given to me when I was a doc student. Jin, don't try to eat the whole pizza in one gulp, right? I think it's okay for us in our own spaces to start with that seed of doing what we can to make these alignments. So for me as a teacher teaching students, First thing I can do in my power is to make sure that what I intend to teach, what I intend students to learn, the way that I'm assessing and giving feedback and evaluation matches that, that they are on board with it. And then from then on, right, who does it get passed to? And that's a dialogue. And then I trust my colleagues with that level to then trickle it up or trickle it down or sideways. So take a bite at a time is the second strategy that I would provide. That Thanks. answer the question a little bit. Thanks, Prof. <laughs> okay, I, was, I was trying to avoid speaking too much, and I think there is a question, but the quick answer, Vina, is, you know, the teaching and learning strategy must be finalized. We've got the strategic policy, we need to finalize the teaching and learning strategy here at UKZN. In that strategy, you're going to see a guideline or framework relating to assessment. What I will ask of every academic is please apply your mind and be part of the process when we're reviewing what the proposal is. So that you on the ground, you the expert, the answer cannot always come from the top. Yes. The policies are just the ideal. How we get there is because of the wonderful professionalism we have from the people, okay, that it's you. You decide. You the you know what the best is for assessing that particular area and how that student who goes out into the world, what skills, what knowledge, what competencies they need to go out with, right? There are some skills we can layer on that by starting. But the input, policy and change and what we do in the classroom has to come from the bottom. Hmm. Can't always come from the top. Um, okay, last. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Patrick. Just, just a short one. Yes. I think what, what, what is important in the question that um, the colleague asked is the context. Mm -hmm. You may have all the relevant tools, but if you are failing to understand your context, mm -hmm. then all the methods will fail. So that's, that's one. Then two, sharing of best practices, I think, is key. Let's learn to unlearn the habit of working in silos. Let's work as communities of practice. Let's share our best practices, but tailor make them to suit the caliber of the students that we are taking in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think what I have here is, is the backward approach you know, to policy development. And, and uh, what I'm saying is, is most times in organizations, um, policies are developed in the, in the, in the um, boardroom while um, you know, it's being pushed down to, to the 
um, to those at the operational level. So I, I think now policymakers must learn from practice in reviewing, revising, or developing policies just to ensure that you know whatever they are putting together as this concrete document uh, not change because you know policy takes time um, for it to get reviewed to change, which means that people are stuck in that in that uh, there's that boundary already that they can operate in. So they must learn from practice also when developing the policy. And I think I, I would say I have learned so much today. I, 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 and I guess you also, everyone here, we've learned so much about intentional design, especially in the space of higher education. Um, and I would like to say a very big thank you to our um, distinguished panel members. Um, and I would like you to please give them a round of applause. Wow. Um, so with, with that, I would like to close the curtain here because I do not want to eat into your lunch um, break. Um, I, and here yeah, I would call it, um, yeah, but it's a break, it's a, yeah. <laughs> not into your break, yes. So um, thank you very much for, for the engagement, um, because without the audience, then we wouldn't be here. And, and, and thank you, everyone. OK, cheers.